Heaven Awaits the Bride, Part 2 Preface Often men identify with the priesthood of Christ and women with the bride of Christ. But in reality, neither the priest nor the bride has anything to do with our own gender. Our Heavenly Father is looking only for His Son in us. He's looking to see if we exhibit the holiness and righteousness that was to be displayed in the lives of his biblical priests. He's looking to see if we exhibit that single-eyed devotion so apparent in in a loving bride, the one who wishes nothing more than to live in perfect union with her husband, even as Christ lives in perfect union with his Father. Since only perfect union will satisfy our Father, He created us so that only perfect union will satisfy his children. The ancient betrothal process in the Bible is a spiritual roadmap for the believer's rite of passage into the consuming intimacy with God in Christ. When we are born again, we are joined to Christ in spirit, translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love seated with him in heavenly places and made co with Christ Jesus of God, uh, of God the Father. So we begin as high as we can get, but not as deep. Depth is a journey. If in this journey we seek the Lord for his sake alone, if we long to know him as he knows us, then he will draw near to us in startling reality. He will ratify the, the, the betrothal covenant into which we entered, arranged by our Heavenly Father at the time of our new birth. Passionately, he will draw us after him and usher us into the stage of our Christian growth that the Bible describes as the time of love in Ezekiel 16.8. The NIV says, I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love. That's Ezekiel 16.8, describing this stage as courtship. For the, be, uh, the betrothed, uh, for the betrothed, this is a time of intense joy and severe testing. An acute longing begins to grow within such believers. They realize that nothing will satisfy this hunger except a deep union with Christ himself. If we will persevere, seeking consolation for our hearts in Christ alone, the Lord will draw us into a spiritual oneness. And once we have been brought into a more complete melding, we know him. Oh, not as we will know him later, nor as we will know him when we have full salvation by receiving our resurrected bodies. But we will know him as the one who will say to us, as he said to Abraham, I know him. In Genesis eighteen nineteen, the Hebrew meaning of the word can be translated, "I am intimate with him." There are three distinct stages within the bridal process. The individual experiences two of these, and one is corporate. This book is an actual account of such a journey, a journey open to all believers into a consuming intimacy with Christ. I'm sharing my love letters with you because the one who gave them asked me to share them. His visitation to me on earth, as well as these particular visions and revelations experienced in heaven, occurred between July 5th, 1995 and July 5th, 1996, with two related visions given later. They were recorded word for word in journals. They chronicle a relentless passion drawing by the Lord unto himself, culminating in a glorious spiritual union. It is my great hope that these will be an encouragement to all who wish to live in God as deeply as possible while on the earth and to know him above all others and above all else, both on the earth and in heaven. For you, Christ has love letters of your own awaiting. The chart on the next page shows each stage, the work accomplished and what is received in each stage. Many of us have some grasp of the first and third stages of this process, but some of us have not comprehended the depth of the impassioned commitment on the part of Christ toward his chosen ones, nor the poignant poignant intimacy with him that is possible during this lifetime within the second stage. So the table is uh, three columns and three rows, and the first column 
um, the first row is who experiences stage of experiences this stage of salvation, and it's number one the individual. In the next section, it's work accomplished. So, the individual, a new birth, a betrothal, a bridal price, dowry, clothed with Christ, spiritual gifts to the bride, marriage contract, formal acceptance, and the covenant cup, first cup of wine. Received in this stage of salvation is repentance and forgiveness of sins, Acts eleven eighteen and ten forty three, declared righteousness in Christ, Romans ten four, the Holy Spirit, John seven thirty nine. New spiritual heart and new human spirit, Ezekiel thirty six twenty six, adoption as heirs, Romans eight seventeen, eternal life, Romans six twenty three. The next stage is number two, the individual. So there was two parts for the individual. This is the second part for the in- individual. The work accomplished in the second section is ongoing sanctification, ratification of betrothal with accompanying gifts. Esther's preparation and testings, deeper union with Christ, a formal betrothal with the status of being married. The bride is a married woman, the groom a married man, but they are not yet a married couple. Received in this stage of salvation, part three, transformation. So it's still part two, and this is the third, third part of part two, transformation of the soul life, which is Matthew sixteen twenty four to 25. And the consecration of the body, Romans twelve one. In the third uh, section, which was the corporate, corporate realized after passing from this life. So that's in the second uh, works accomplished number part two for that for number three is a the resurrection resurrected body, b linen garments of righteous deeds, the corporate bride of Christ, the Father's blessing the cup of new wine, second cup of wine, and married, the bridal week, full marital status, marriage supper of the Lamb, reigning with Christ on earth. Received in this stage of salvation is salvation of the body, Philippians 3.21, full salvation and married. Chapter 1, The Visitation. The edges of the air were on fire. I raised my hand to shield my eyes from the searing light. The very molecules of the air within our apartment were burning white hot from a central point. Swiftly, the Holy Spirit spoke. Rise, Anna. At the time I was down on my knees in prayer asking for more of God. Now, however, I had stopped praying for I was uh, struck by the wonder materializing before my eyes the air sizzled and curled from the center of this phenomenon the fiery glory of the lord began to burn through the wall of our apartment the holy spirit had set me on my feet for i could not stand seeing the lord's glory while on earth and in one's body is very different from seeing him above while in spirit his glory is almost more than the physical body can bear angels of his presence as i rose to my feet stately angels of his presence stepped through the center of the blazing light to enter my room they came in pairs but separated as they touched the room's atmosphere four angels stood before me in a semicircle to my left four angels in the semicircle to my right they wore pale lavender robes embroidered with deep purple and gold on the sleeves and hem golden girdles bound these garments across their chests Each angel carried something in his hands to the manner of an emissary. Then four additional angels similarly dressed entered the room through the burning air. Each of these held one pole of a canopy, the sort one might see in a Jewish wedding, and as they moved forward, the word love could be seen at times in the canopy's fabric. King Jesus The Holy Spirit stirred and swirled into a whirlwind in response to the one who now stepped beneath the canopy. King Jesus, brighter than the sun, entered the room. Through the shock of unbelievable light, I could see faintly that he was wearing a rich purple cloak that opened in the front and hung in folds to the ground. It had long sleeves and was edged with a wide gold brocaded border 
and beneath this garment was a white robe that also reached to his feet. The robe was grappled across his chest with a golden girdle. On his head was a golden crown that was similar in some respects to the crowns used to cap Torah scrolls. He was terrible in majesty, awesome in holiness and splendid in beauty. The Holy Spirit swirled around me to strengthen me, for the intense light and power emanating from the Lord made it difficult for me to stand. Gifts Then, as if by some silent command from Jesus, the nearest angel in the semicircle stepped toward me. In his hands he held a golden crown, which he carefully placed upon my head. Wisdom, he said, smiling slightly. And then crossing his arms over his chest, he nodded respectfully and stepped back into the semicircle. The angel opposite him in the semicircle stepped forward with the gift he was carrying. He placed golden earrings on my ears. Knowledge, he said. And then he too folded his arms across his chest and moved back to join the other angels. One by one, each of them remaining angels of his presence brought the gift that he held in his hands. After the gift was placed upon me, the angel named the spiritual gift it symbolized. The gifts these angels presented included a golden heart that hung on a chain over my heart, understanding, golden bracelets on each wrist, discretion, a golden nose ornament, discernment, golden rings on each finger, the ability to communicate, and a golden necklace, the fear of the Lord. The eighth angel stepped forward and blew a mist of gold over me. It covered me like a veil from my head to my feet. Favour, he said as he smiled. He too nodded and stepped back into the semicircle. The response. I was stunned. I'd never received such an immediate and extravagant answer to prayer. I looked down at the gifts and I was able to see and they were princely. Gifts of my father, from my father. But why the canopy? Lord, I said, let all these gifts be within for your pleasure. He smiled at me because you have asked that these be for my pleasure. They will be for my pleasure and will also be experienced by others. These gifts will unlock my heart to you and to my body. All mysteries are bound up, locked away in me, Anna. But the mystery of my love is the greatest revelation of all. Moving toward me, he said, My chosen one, my love, a fruitful bow, an orchid of fruitfulness. Lord, I replied, I am barren. I had never born physical children. He smiled again as he answered, You will bear and be more fruitful than if you had born physical children. I have withheld your bearing, but now I place my hands upon you that you might bring forth good fruit, many children, all heirs, kings and priests to their father he placed his hands upon me fire and power surged through me he continued to speak no longer will you bear shame because of unfruitfulness ratification of betrothal cleave to me he said i am your husband let my covering be on your head his eyes burned into me as he continued i am the lord your god and none is like me I am the beginning and the end. I am your health, your protection, and your fruitfulness. Thousands upon thousands of heirs will you bear. Those who will walk right into my kingdom, those who will be at home in my chambers. Anna, he said in a more intimate tone, You are more beautiful now than earlier. My heart is turned towards you. My desire is for you. You have captured my heart. Lock this away in your heart and my promises are true and sure. I could hardly breathe. Lord, I whispered, let it be soon. It is already accomplished, he said. Bear fruit for the kingdom. Shun pride, point not the finger. The departure. He bowed at the he bowed at the waist as a sign of his departure and he stepped back under the canopy. Once under the canopy, he turned and walked through the burning opening in the wall of the apartment. The four angels holding the poles of the canopy also bowed and walked out with him, holding the canopy over his head. He disappeared. The angels of his presence also signified their departure, and two by two they followed the Lord. 
Then the Holy Spirit swirled before me again, this time gathering up all of the remaining fire and light. He too passed through the apartment wall. Instantly, the gifts became internal and no longer adorned me externally. The wall closed. Silence. Father, I whispered, who am I to marry a king? I came with nothing. I have no dowry. I do not even have a hope chest with linens in it. And before I could continue, my father thundered audibly in the room. Can I not provide linens for my children? Immediately I heard a knock at the front door of the apartment. Although engrossed in all that was occurring, I managed to cross to the door and open it. The caravan. Hello, Anna, blurted a tall angel. I say that he was an angel because he called me by my name that at that time was known only in heaven. Also, he was dressed in Bedouin attire, uncommon apparel for this continent. Beyond him in the parking lot, I saw a caravan of 24 camels with Bedouin, Bedouin attendants. I shot a quick glance around the apartment complex. My husband and I were living in a low-rent housing faculty in Florida and we had just uh, had adjusted fairly well to these living conditions since we had learned to duck when the neighbours were shooting at each other. However, I was not sure how they might react to a camel caravan, although usually the complex was alive with adults and children. No one was in sight. Hope Chess the angel continued, We have brought you hope chess, he said, effusively. Twenty-four chess, where would you like them? My hands went to my face in amazement. I was flooded with so many mixed emotions that I began to laugh and cry at the same time. It is all right, Anna, the large angel said comfortingly. Do not be troubled, your father loves you. In the parking lot, the doe and attendant signalled the camels to kneel down, and these angels began unloading the chess. Between the laughing and the crying, I said, can you stack the chess in here, meaning in the living room? We certainly can, he brightened. He whistled to the other angels and indicated that with his head to bring the chess. And then he turned his attendant to me again. His attention to me again. Hope is of God, Anna. And these, each chest your father gives to you is hope that you can share. And this is a greater gift to your husband than laces and embroidered towels, the angel smiled. The attendants began carrying the chest into the living room with two angels holding each chest. All of these angels wore camel-coloured desert clothing. After delivering a chest, each pair of angels smiled broadly, like those wishing to show themselves extremely agreeable. Then they returned to the caravan. The chests seemed to be covered in camel skin. They were large and looked something like treasure chests. The five stra- straps encircling each tre- chest were gold, and the two handles of carrying were an intense light, uh, intense blue. The opening for a key on each chest was encased in gold, with the shape of the keyhole itself being a cross. No one ever gave me a physical key, however. The receipt. Because of their size, the chest stacked up to and then through the apartment ceiling. The large angel rocked back and forth on his heels, enjoying the sight. Yes, he smiled. There is great hope here. And then he took a pencil from behind his ear and he pulled out a clipboard that held a receipt. Sign here, please, he said, extending the clipboard to me. What name should I use, I asked. Anna would be fine. I wrote Anna on the white receipt and then handed the clipboard back to him. All right, he said with a sigh that denoted closure of omission. He pulled out the undercopy of the receipt and handed it to me. Here is your receipt, 24 chests full of hope. Rebecca. Suddenly, I remember Rebecca and how she had watered the camels as well as drawn water from Abraham's servant. Would you like some water or something? I asked haltingly, not sure of what to say. I know, he laughed. We're better... Water than, uh, we have better water than your city's water system can supply. We'll be going now before we draw a crowd. Thank you for bringing the chests, I said. Oh, our pleasure, he smiled. Shalom. The attendants whistled and clicked their tongues for the camels to rise. 
The large angel grasped at the reins attached to the headgear of the lead camel and guided him around so that the caravan could reverse its direction in the parking lot. And then he and the camels with the attendants began to leave. Suddenly, they disappeared. And just as suddenly, life in the apartment complex returned to normal. I closed the door and leaned against it, looking at the chest piled through the ceiling. Thank you, Daddy, I whispered. My father spoke audibly again. You have a bigger and better hope than any princess brought to her wedding day. Now, he continued, come up here. (laughs) Amazingly, in my spirit, I began to rise. Chapter 2, The Ascent As I rose, I realised that a protective shield surrounded me. It was clear and round. I wondered if this shield was present at all times, even though I did not see it. I sat down, drawing my knees up to my chest, with my arms hugging my legs. The deeper life. I began to reflect during this ascent. How did all this begin? Certainly when I was born again, I thought to myself. But I wanted to think beyond Christian infancy and adolescence. No, I thought, it began when I decided that I wanted to live as deeply as possible, to touch the essence of life itself. The only way to do that was to know truly life himself. I'd come to a place in my life where I did not want to live like a pebble skipped across the water. I wanted to experience deeply. I wanted to know him. As I reflected, I realised that it had taken me 20 years as a Christian to come to this conclusion. 20 years to be persuaded that to know and to fellowship with God is the noblest, purest, uh, the noblest pursuit of mankind. Why, I wondered, had it taken me so long? The ambush. As I neared the second heaven, I had a sense of foreboding. Suddenly, in the distance, the atmosphere ripped and a black swarm poured through the opening. From my perspective, the swarm looked like locusts or bees. Whatever it was, it was rapidly heading in my direction. Demons, black, red-eyed, putrid-smelling, surrounded the shield. They looked like winged gargoyles. They began screaming curses at me. I felt trapped, cornered. These spirits began to vomit a sickly green bile onto the shield. The bile must have had the properties of acid, for it began to burn into the surface, causing it to warp and thin like heated plastic. Then with sharp claws, the demons began to dig through these weakened areas. Lord, help me, I cried. Angelic help. Immediately, shrieks came from several of these demons on the outer edge of the pack. Quickly, they turned their attention from me to two warrior angels clothed in bright armour and to the angel Azar. I was very glad to see Azar, and when I had seen him before, he had told me that he was an angel of helps assigned to protect me. Well, I certainly needed help now. He was dressed in work overalls over which he had worn a thin brown robe. A white tool pouch hung from his belt. Two suction cups that had a handle between them also hung from his belt. These cups were the kind used to move large sheets of glass. In addition, he had a tank harnessed to his back, and I cheered when I saw him. These warriors were dressed in armour similar to that worn by centurion guards, except that the armour was shot through with light. Instead of swords, they carried long rods that displayed the word of God. The demons recoiled at the touch of these rods as if receiving a violent shock. While wild animals with a fresh kill, however, they fought viciously to retain their prey. While the animals were fi- the warriors were fighting the enemy, Azar pulled out a hose that was attached to the tank harnessed to his back. Quickly, he hosed down the bubble to stop the bile from eating through the surface. And just as rapidly, he attached the two suction cups to the bubble. And then he grabbed the handle that was between them. With a great heave, he started to pull the shield away, upward, away from the battle. And the demons began to scream when they realised we were getting away. The warrior angels held the demons at bay while we had made our escape. 
and as we climbed higher, I saw that the warriors were routing the enemy, driving them back toward the rip in the atmosphere. I sighed in relief. The corridor. As we arose, the sound of demonic clamour faded. A great sense of peace came over me. Azar had pulled the shield into an invisible passageway. On either side of the bubble, thousands of angels were flying in a slow upward spiral. They formed a magnificent, shimmering corridor to paradise. They smiled at us as we passed. Laser-like streaks of light flashed by us going up and down, and they, these were the angels who were travelling the passageway. Paradise. Before we entered a greater light at the end of the corridor, Azar veered off to carry me into paradise a different way. Suddenly, the bubble surfaced through an opening in the turf of God's perfectly groomed park. As soon as the shield touched the grass, it went pink, bursting as easily as a fragile soap bubble. Sorry to burst your bubble, Azar joked. Thank you for helping me, Azar, I said with great relief. We aim to please, he drawled in a cowhand accent. He pulled out a clothes whisk and he began dusting me off. I suppose I had bubble flakes on me. I looked around. How at home I felt here now. Even though I had visited paradise many times, the beauty and grandeur of God's park always overwhelmed me. Azar continued concerning the demons. They're just a nuisance. Those have no real power, and that's the reason they travel in packs. They're a a bother, though. They can slow you down. And the warriors, I asked. Well, he smiled, sometimes I need help myself. And those were watchers, part of the border patrol. They refused to take any nonsense from those wishing to interfere. He stepped back looking at me. So how do you feel? I feel fine, I said. Will you thank the watchers who helped me? I will, he smiled. He began taking his arms out of the straps and held the tank to his back. Are you going to see your daddy, he asked. Yes, I smiled, handing him the suction cups that had fallen to the ground when the bubble burst. Angelic escorts. Two angels who looked like lovely young women came flying by. They wore pale blue robes and had no wings. Come fly with us, Anna, they said. Azar smiled. (laughs) They will escort you to the throne room. Will you come with us, I asked Azar. I need to test this equipment before I store it, he said. Go on, he continued. You'll enjoy the flight. I lifted my arms towards the angels, indicating that I wanted to join them. Laughing, they swooped down and picked me up, one on either side. Immediately, they executed two loop-the-loops that took my breath away. Azar laughed and called after me. Have a good time with your daddy. Off they flew with me between them. They were like precision stunt flyers executing perilous aerobatics over the terrain of paradise. They bankrolled Dove and looped the loop. I knew that they were trying to share an experience with me that I could not have had on earth. However, I was beginning to be grateful for that fact. Uh, They were as exuberant as children. The throne room. The throne room. We arrived very high in the throne room and rather far away from the throne. However, from this vantage point, I had a panoramic view of the glorious bow of colours emanating from my father, the thousands of redeemed on the sea of glass, the angels coming and going, the elders, the four living creatures and the activity around the throne, which I suppose to be official business of the kingdom. I wonder if I should disturb my father, I asked myself. I did not wander long. Come here, Anna, my father spoke in that loud but soft voice that penetrates to the core of your being. I did not wander long. (laughs) The angels who were carrying me responded instantly to his request, and they made a steep turn and flew toward the throne area. Too rapidly for comfort, I might say. Right before we arrived at the throne, the angels dipped down and made an abrupt landing at a respectful distance from the activity. Unfortunately, they released me too quickly. The momentum caused me to slide on. Those conducting official business moved out of the way, being unsure of how far I might travel. I was incredibly embarrassed, and the angels who brought me were abashed. 
But like a powerful head of government whose two-year-old stumbles into his office, my heavenly father was more concerned about my feelings than his own. Not bad, he chuckled, commenting on my landing. Just out of the nest, daddy, I sputtered, trying to help the situation. He spoke graciously to the escort angels, seeking to relieve their distress. Thank you for bringing my child, he said. They bowed and deeply and shaking their heads and biting their lips as they excused themselves. I turned in an apologetic way to those who had been in conference. I did not realise so much was going on up here. I looked back at my father. Are you busy? There was a pause and then God laughed. The elders laughed. The redeemed and the angels laughed. I laughed. It was a laugh that rolled and continued to roll throughout heaven. My father... After the sound subsided, my father said, Come here, my child. He picked me up and he set me on the armrest of the throne. Those who had been meeting with him bowed and withdrew. I looked up toward the area of his face. Our father is light, dazzling light. He has a form and even looks clothed in a garment of light. From his chest upward, it is impossible to see his face because of the brilliance. The white light of his presence radiates outward to create an aura of jewel-like colours. It's resplendent. Even though he embodies holiness and majesty, to be near him is to have the deepest sense of coming home. I felt completely safe and utterly loved. There must be millions of people speaking to you right now, I said to my father. Millions, he affirmed. But each of my children has a personal relationship with me. Each feels like an only child receiving all of my attention. The Golden Eagle. So, my father continued, how is my Golden Eagle today? I suppose that he referred to me as a juvenile eagle because of my inglorious landing near the throne. I'm fine, Daddy, I said. How long does it take a golden eagle to mature? When your feathers become pure white, you are ready to nest above. You must fly the mountains and valleys of heaven, though, and you must eat from my hand. Do not seek that which the eagles below seek. They seek fresh meat, fresh revelation. But their game is earthbound. They seek revelation, and so is their revelation. It's earthbound. Time, seasons, natural signs, and consequences of sin. I've given them to see into human souls, but all of it concerns the needed revelation for the outer court. Most eagles labor there, for their for that need is great. He continued. There are those eagles who fly in the holy place. They minister to me more intimately. They fly among the branches of the golden lampstand. They, like David, are in communion with my son, eating the shoe bread. Their revelation is used to assist those who minister at the golden altar of incense. Fewer minister in the holy place, but who ministers to me before the ark. The great high priest. The great high priest, Daddy, I said. Yes, my son. He is the great white eagle. As well as the great high priest. He is the sacrifice and he is the blood sprinkled. How many enter into that place, meaning the holy of holies? One, I answered. One, he reiterated. He is the door, the way, the truth and the life. He draws near to minister to me. And when you, join to him, eat from my hand, when you eat from the hand of the one who sits upon the throne, you too become white. Narrower and narrower and narrower is the way, Anna. Fewer and fewer are those who will continue. But for those who will be drawn near to me, for those who will lay their hands upon the ark and die to the fleshly use of their own souls, they will live between the cherubim and will bear much fruit for the kingdom. Suddenly, he opened his eyes in vision to see two white eagles cartwheeling. He continued, I have chosen you and you have chosen me, and I have chosen you. It was as though the cartwheeling could go on and on like an eternal will, and the vision ended. My father continued, Let nothing turn you to course of food. 
Helpful though you think that would be to mankind. Eat from my hand and sleep between the cherubim. Golden manna. When the vision ended, I realized that a golden rain of light was falling on me. It piled up on my head, my shoulders, and then my upturned hands. It was soft like snow, but not cold. Golden manna, my child. Food for the golden eagle. He scraped the manna from my head, shoulders, and hands and held out his hand of light from which he wanted me to eat. Food from the hand of God, Anna. I ate from his hand. He continued, that which goes into your mouth will issue forth through your hand so that you may write what you see and hear. The golden rain ceased. Betrothal. Now, for the reason I summoned you, Anna, my father continued, you must make yourself ready. Since your betrothal to my son, you are no longer your own. You belong to him. Prepare yourself as Esther did. We love you and you are called and chosen. Therefore your need is not eliminated for the all-important training that lies in obedience. Your obedience must arise out of a perfect love for me, not under constraint but for love's sake. Catch the little foxes, Anna, that my harvest may be full. He continued, and this time will pass swiftly. We want you to treasure all of it. Courtship is a memorable, me- memorable time, memorable time, a suspended time. It is a time when lovers walk hand in hand, a time of growing in knowledge and understanding concerning the other. The time of courtship on earth is sweet, but you, Anna, are in a courtship with my son, the prince, none more perfect and beautiful, none more powerful and glorious, my son. Abandon yourself to the experience of the time. The flesh versus the spirit. I do not want you to live by what your eyes see or your ears hear or by what you reason, he said. I want you to live by every word that proceeds from my mouth to you. The arm of the flesh can never do my will. Try my way, Anna. You have given your own way a princely chance. Now take the way of the Prince himself and mind of Christ, the emotions of Christ, the will of Christ, all of him, none of your flesh, none. Complete the total union. He deserves nothing less, does he not? Yes, Daddy, I said quietly. That is my girl, he said, picking me up and placing me onto the sea of glass before him. The emerald. My father held out a large emerald to me. For your crown, Anna, he said. I took it. No, oh, Daddy, it's beautiful, I replied, although I did not know what crown he was referring. Thank you. And there was a pause, and then he asked, Would you like to see your beloved? I felt embarrassed, for he had read my innermost desire. I ducked my head and pulled out the golden key that hangs from a scarlet cord around my neck. Jesus had given the key to me. It unlocks the golden filigree gate to the enclosed garden of my heart in paradise. The Lord has told me that if I wanted to see him, that he would meet me there. I held up the golden key and smiled at my father. Go to him, my father said tenderly. His glory came from him and kissed my forehead. Instantly, I was before the walled garden. Chapter 3, The Beloved Quickly I placed the key into the lock and opened the gate to the enclosed garden. I dropped the scarlet cord back around my neck, quietly stepping inside the gate. As it closed behind me, it clicked shut. Within the garden, stillness and peace were there. I stood facing the three-tiered fountain in the centre of the garden. Cool, clear water flowed from its top and gently pooled in its widely rimmed basin. The large flowering apricot tree arched over the fountain with the bench for two at its base. I let my eyes rest upon the colours and varieties of the plantings within the ward area. All sorts of scented herbs grew among the jonquils, tulips and daffodils. The fruit-bearing trees and vines were heavy with flowers. But they also had leaves and rudiments of both summer and fall fruit. As with the trees and vines, the flowers of spring, summer and fall were blooming at the same time within the beds. A slight breeze blew across the garden, stirring the aromas. 
The fragrance was unique. On earth, we do not experience the three growing seasons together. I was reminded of Aaron's staff that sprouted and blossomed and bore fruit at the same time. I wondered if the three seasons being represented within the garden had something to do with the priesthood of believers. But I did not know. I breathed in deeply and exhaled slowly. Peace. Not alone. Suddenly I heard someone clearing his throat in order to call attention to his presence. <clears throat> I looked up and Jesus was sitting in the large apricot tree. My Lord, I said in amazement, what are you doing up there? I am up a tree, Anna, he said. I laughed, what are you doing up a tree? You want me up here, he replied. I want you up a tree, I laughed, for I thought he was joking. Yes, he answered, I am localized and you know where I am. You can come to the base of the tree and ask, my, ask me questions and then go about your life. I'm in a portion of your heart, but I do not have free access to the whole garden. I was cut to the quick. I swallowed hard. Come down, my lord, I said. Forgive me. These mysteries are so exciting. Well, forgive me that, that you have begun to use me, he asked, jumping down from the tree. Well, the very thing that I have hated I'm doing, I said. He walked toward me. What do you want of me, Anna? Information. There is a vast supply. Is that what you want? No, of course not, I replied. These mysteries are so... Tertiliating, he said. Well, they are. Seductive, he added. Yes, I affirmed. But they are part of me. And you have been given all of me. It seems a poor exchange. Oh, my friend, I continued, forgive me. I love you and want to be with you. I want you to have access to the entire garden. You were called to know mysteries, Anna, but not to use me, he said. The still soul. I was speechless. When years before I had decided to pursue the Lord earnestly, I withdrew my senses from the overstimulation of worldly input. I felt that I needed to still my soul if I wanted him to come knocking at my heart. The withdrawal from keeping myself entertained with the world was exceedingly painful. But now the Lord was saying that I had replaced the worldly with spiritual entertainment, desiring more and more spiritual knowledge, a subtler and less objectionable substitute, but still a substitute for him. I did not know what to say. I was stunned. He took me by the arm and he guided me gently to the rim of the fountain. Sit down, he said quietly. He sat beside me. I looked into his face and the beauty and clearness of those eyes were beyond compare. He took my hand and held it. A true friend. My Anna, he said, be a true friend to me as I am to you. I want you to desire my company. I am a king, but I desire to be with you as any lover would long to be with the one he loves. I do not command your love. I humbly ask for it. I do not dictate that you be with me, Anna. I long for you to seek me, and therefore I wait for you, Anna. I dropped my head, Lord. Ah, oh, I said, I am so selfish. I am using you for my own pleasure. Even a king. He lifted my chin. Anna, look at me, he said. Even a king wishes to be loved for himself, not for the gifts he bestows. He smiled at me. If you do not enjoy being with me now, why do you believe you will enjoy my company for eternity? He looked down at my hand. The pursuer wants to be pursued also, he said gently. He looked up and then over to the gate. Have you ever thought of standing at the entrance to the garden with the gate opened, waiting for me? No, I replied. You have expected me to travel the entire distance to you. Do you not think that I would be pleased to have you waiting with part of the distance covered so that we might see each other sooner? Yes, I said quietly. He smiled at me. Come, my love, let us walk. And he helped me to rise and put his arms around my waist. We began to walk the path that circles the garden. I have called you to myself, he said, looking down at me. Few understand what that means, Anna. Would you like to know? Yes, I said tentatively. 
I say this in fear and trembling because I fear not getting something I want. He laughed, I know this. What does that say about our relationship? It sounds like I do not trust you, I said. And that is what it sounds like, he agreed. It is true? Yes, he replied. Well, Lord, help me, I pleaded. I want to trust you. My wonderful girl, he said, my love. Do you not understand? My desire is for you. My passions burn with eternal fires. No mere tear could quench them. It would take the tears from eternity and still the fire of my passion for you would not be quenched. Why would you not trust the one who loves you as I love? I could not answer. I I did not know why. I did not abandon myself to God. I, I shook my head. Who am I to deserve such love? You were chosen for me by my father, he said earnestly. With wisdom, that is beyond wisdom, he has chosen you. And then increase my desire to be with you, I said. To desire you more than an anointing or spiritual knowledge or... I could not think fast enough to enumerate. I shook my head in frustration and then blurted out, I love you. I clung to him, burying my face in his chest. You are the dearest friend I have. I love you. He placed his arms around me lovingly. My own, he said. He dropped his head back and laughed as in pain mixed with joy. And then bringing his head to mine, he spoke softly. Anna, Anna. There was great pain in his voice. Please do not do this again. He held me trembling. Anna, do not do this again. I had hurt him deeply by treating him presumptuously casually like someone with whom I had to deal in order to receive that which was my primary interest but he loved me he wanted my company and he wanted me to desire his that which is the deepest desire of every human heart was mine and I was seeking secondary rewards my heart began to break the pain was excruciating The garden responded also. The smell of myrrh flooded the area. I glanced at the myrrh tree. Red tears of aromatic gum were slipping from the heart of the wood. I pulled back, holding him at arm's length, looking into his eyes. My God, my God, I said. I'm not worthy of you. I cannot even respond correctly to the depth of your love. Is she? If you do not give to me a love that matches yours in intensity... The pain in my heart was so severe that I could not finish the sentence. With all that was in me, I pushed past the extreme pain to cry out, Oh, please help me to love you as you love me. I am willing, Lord, but I cannot do this myself. You must do this through me, please. The impartation. He looked at me intently. Then he took my right hand into his and turned it over and tenderly kissed the center of it. Receive, he said. Immediately I could feel the spirit surging through me. There is no greater closeness than to share one life, he said. In the blur of light and power that followed, I saw worlds collide and millions of people being born again. I saw death and life, wave upon wave of ecstasy rolled over me. I thought I would burst into a million pieces of being unable to contain such heights of love. I lost track of where I was or even who I was. I lost track of everything but love himself. How long this impartation lasted, I do not know. But when the power began to subside, the garden slowly came back into focus for me. I was fuzzy though, blurry and unstable. I had to be steadied. He spoke reassuringly. This quiet place, meaning the garden, is within you, Anna, where you may meet with me at all times. My vision cleared finally. I looked into his face. He smiled at me. My Anna, he said, I will show you another garden. Instantly, he became the white angle. And come, Anna, he said. He urged, he come, come, come. I climbed back onto his back and he laid down with my arms around his neck. And as I had done it in the past, and then... With one mighty movement of his wings, he flew over the garden wall. Immediately we were on earth. Vision of the bride. He flew over a vast desert. In vision we were approaching what seemed to be a garden in the centre of this wilderness. The white eagle spoke, I will show you the bride, Anna. 
At the center of this garden in the wilderness, I saw a lovely young woman, the corporate bride of Christ. She was clothed in the glory of God. The white eagle continued, The Holy Spirit is training the bride. I have taken her into the wilderness to teach her to sing. She is a virgin, undefiled by idols. She will not name them or consider their beds. Her eye is single and I feel her, all her sight. She will not lust for idols or cut her eyes to entice them. My beloved will desire me alone. The young woman began to sing. Day star of the morning, dawn before our eyes. Rise that we might see your face, Prince of Paradise. Clothe yourself in splendor, clothe yourself in might. Trail supernal righteousness, quintessence of all light. The Lord continued, The Holy Spirit will be a pillar of fire and a pillar of the cloud of God's glory. As with the children of Israel, he will lead her into the wilderness and he will protect her. The glory of God will rest upon her. Intimacy in the Garden Our Father is restoring the intimacy of the garden, Anna. He is giving me a bride who will walk with me hand in hand. He continued, The pillar of fire will consume all that is not me. The pillar of cloud will cover her. The Holy Spirit passionately desires that I have a pure bride. He will teach her and lead her. He will give her the oils and the perfume spices. He will feed her manna from above as he fed the children of Israel in the desert so that within and without she might be prepared. Nurtured and warm, she will grow and bloom for me alone. The fragrance of her perfumes will be for me alone and she will sing, sing for me alone. The glory will be a shield for her, blinding her eyes of the wicked. The cloud will cause them to stumble and fall and they will grope as in the darkest night, but they will not find her. Come to the garden. The call has gone out from the very halls of heaven to come to the garden, but most will remain outside. I myself call, come to the garden, but many who do not enter are content to eat the fruit nearest the gate. Few seek me in the centre of the garden. However, for the few who do make the journey, searching for me, they find an open door to the Father's heart. For in the centre of the garden is the entrance to my Father's heart, and within his heart I live and move. As for you, Anna, he said, leave behind all that has been an anchor to your soul. Loose the rope, trim the tail, the sails, and let me set the course. Come into the wilderness, for in the wilderness there is a secret garden, and in the centre of that garden the doorway to God. We began to fly away from the garden in the wilderness. The mountains. Suddenly the vision ended. I found that we were actually flying up a mountain range on earth. Beneath us the valley lay lush and green, and on several of the encircling mountains there were apple orchids. These were laid out in neat rows and were carefully tended. The sun shone on what seemed to be a river winding through the valley, far below. However, as we drew nearer, I realised that it was a road. And before us, the top of the highest mountain, was a large protruding rock. It formed a ledge. The white eagle had taken me to this rock before. I buried my face in his scented feathers as I clung to his neck. He was taking me to his nest. Chapter 4. Lesson of the Birds We continued to fly higher, and before we neared the tallest mountain, I saw vultures circling the valley below us. Their bold heads looked raw, unclean, and repugnant. The white eagle spoke. Pay no attention to them. They seek that which is dead, not the living, and I diverted my eyes. Chimney swifts. Suddenly, thousands of small dark birds began to pass us. The sky was filled with them. They chattered loudly among themselves. The sound of their wings added to the commotion of their flight. They were noisy and gabby that they did not recognise the white eagle flying among them. They called past us to confer and reconfer with one another. Chimney swifts, the white eagle said. They live in soot. They rise, but not from fire. Covered with charcoal, they rise from the darkness of hiding among that which is charred. Their tails are like snakes' tongues. Do not fly with them. Hearing their communal chatter, the word gossip came to mind. For prison, 
for poison is in their tails, I thought. An updraft mercifully carried us higher than their piercing calls. I was troubled by the Lord's warning and began to ponder what he had said. Often conversation among the brethren did seem to be more like a checkout counter tabloid than the admonition from Paul to let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Indeed, I thought, how can we fly higher if we are earthbound by our fascination with hearing of and talking about sin? Not only the world sins, but also sin among the brethren. Our earthbound focus has driven a stake into the ground to which our spirits have tethered. I blinked back into the present moment as a dark bird of prey passed beneath us. Hawks, hawk, the Lord said. Do not fly with them. Hawking your wares, I murmured to myself. I had not thought of that phrase in years and certainly not in connection with the work of the kingdom. However, now that I thought about it, it seemed that in trying to reach the world for Christ, some of us had become remarkably like the world. We rivaled sideshow barkers in our flamboyant peddling. Could it be that we were cheapening the depth of commitment to which the Lord had called us? Was the salt losing its saviour? Its (laughs) savour? Before I could consider this further, a falcon swooped past us. Falcons will con you, the white eagle said. They lie, the lie will run your life afoul. Do not fly with them. With whom may I fly, Lord, I asked. Fly with me, Anna. Fly with me. Eagles nest high. They do not travel in flocks like ducks, following one another instead of the Lord. They do not roost together like chickens, seeking protection from others instead of Christ. They do not hunt bugs together like geese, seeking provision from one and from other than the Lord. Eagles nest high. Do you wish to fly with me, Anna? Yes, Lord, I said. Stop trying to be part of the flock that does not follow the Lord. Turn into the wind and let the currents lift you higher. The rock. Immediately, the wind swelled beneath his wings. We will soar, Anna. We will soar. He exclaimed, we did soar higher and higher. Leave your fathers in your mother's house. The king desires your company. And with a mighty upsurge of wind and power, we soared to the rock near the top of the mountain. The great white eagle gently descended. He settled upon the rim of the large nest. I climbed from his back and I sat down near its centre. The nest was made of strong tree branches. And when I was seated on its floor, the rim was about chest high frankincense within its circumference there was a pungent aroma of frankincense purity i thought to myself that is what the lord has been saying through the lesson of the birds it's not enough to love and want to be with him he wants a bride who is pure one who is free from the world the flesh and the devil also one who will not participate in the sins of immature christians one who is willing to be transformed into his likeness I folded my arms on top of the nest and I rested my head on my hands, looking out. We were very high above the valley. You could see for miles, and the land looked fertile. I had noticed a few white feathers within the nest when I sat down. And as I looked out over the valley, I wondered how many of my own juvenile feathers had been replaced by the strong, mature white ones. Am I growing up? Am I being transformed? Am I willing to pay the price? My Heavenly Father has asked me this question when I became his Chancellor as Secretary to the King. I answered that I was willing, and sometimes, however, I find that I answer before I know the cost, the real cost. And now I wanted to ask myself the same question. Am I willing to pay the price? Really willing? Do I want to give up the habits that I consider minor infractions, the ones that which the devil whispers to me, it's all right this time? Am I willing to let the Holy Spirit bring me into a disciplined life, the life of a disciple? My thoughts continued. And my motives, do I want success or am I willing to allow him to work through me, freely embracing the visible outcome or lack of visible outcome, whichever he chooses? What reward do I seek, him or my own glory, being the bride he desires or becoming a marketable commodity? What reward do I seek? I turned to look at the white eagle. 
he had changed into Jesus. The Lord now was sitting on the rim of the nest with his feet on its floor. In his left hand he held a large pink rose. The flesh may look good, he said, but the thorns on this rose can cause many wounds. Suddenly in his right hand appeared a bouquet of what looked like red tulips. This is the rose of Sharon, he continued. It grows within my garden. I want you to be such a rose, Emma, a rose within, without thorns. The pink rose disappeared as he continued. Testings crack the grip of the flesh. Let yourself be poured from vessel to vessel so that cracked sediment can be left behind. He handed to me the bouquet of the red rose of Sharon. For you, Anna, he said. My lord, they are beautiful, I responded. But they did not die here on earth. They will not die, he smiled. And when you are rewarded by the reward, life, even life on earth, becomes electric, mysterious, pulsating, with true eternal life. You become a life-giving spirit, for my spirit touches others through you. He continued, when I in greater measure flow through you, my reward is with me. Fortress tumble, walls crack and fall, more life rushes through your spirit and overflows to others. But you, to benefit, you too are invigorated by being a channel of my life. The choice was clear, life or death. If I wanted more life, more of him, it would cost me. What will it cost me? I quickly asked myself. Everything, I quickly answered. Everything else. But what is everything else? I again asked myself. Death. Everything outside of him is death. Death wearing a mask, mere delusion. No, I thought to myself, let others have more of the world. I want more of God. I got up from the floor of the nest and I sat beside him on its rim. I looked into those clear eyes. I want you as my reward, Lord. Since you have promised to be my reward, the only reward I will accept is you. Laying the bouquet in my lap, I put my arms around him, resting my head on his chest. You, Lord, I want my lover, my friend, I want my husband and my strong tower. I love you and will be satisfied with nothing but you. My little princess, he said, kissing me softly on my forehead, I love you. Oh, I tilted my head to look up to him. Thank you for loving me, I said. And then I returned my head to his chest. Oh, how secure I felt with his arms around me. How happy, how complete and totally at peace. I asked quietly, did you watch me grow up? Yes, he answered tenderly. I wish I could have watched you grow up, I said. We sat together quietly, holding one another. We do not need words, do we, Anna? Give me your hand, he said. He took my hand and placed it over his heart. I could feel and hear his heart beating. He looked down at his hand, covering mine. My heart beats for you, Anna. And when I looked up into his face, his eyes were full of tears. I love you, he said. Suddenly, before us in the air were 24 spirits. They were ice blue like clear gemstones. I could see right through them. In a stately manner, they began to dance to heavenly music that seemed to come from nowhere. They danced on the air as if it were a floor. However, when they made a circle, it was vertical like a wheel. Their demeanour was reverential and they began to sing. Let the earth hear heaven declare, hear earth its voice. Paradise breathes out a prayer, trees and rocks rejoice. Every minute, every hour, singing songs unsung, praising mysteries of his power, blades of grass a tongue. Endless wonder, endless awe, endless pure delight. Life and love, the spirit's law in heaven, land of light. Ever seeing, yet unseen, spirits join as one, extolling God, our gracious King, extolling Christ, his Son. Hear, O earth, as heaven sings, echo back its praise. Silent, joyful thunderings to God, the Ancient of Days. After their song ended, the dance continued to heavenly music. I remained with my head resting on the Lord's shoulder as I watched the spirits complete their dance. I wondered if the Lord would be wooing me and always as he was doing now. Will it always be like this, I asked. He smiled, no, Anna. As on earth, the preparation for marriage is not marriage, so with the birds. 
a couple in mating rituals is not the couple after consummation and nesting begins. Yet each period of time is rich in itself. You know, not like a static routine. Why should you? Why should you mind? Why should you mind change? Eat what is set before you and enjoy the journey today. The spirits completed their exquisite offering, and the music ended. I sat up. Is she? And I both clapped in appreciation. Deeply meaningful, dear friends, he said to the spirits, and he turned to me. Hold out your right hand. I did, and instantly the spirits flew to me. Each spirit poured into my hand a small deposit of blue salt, and then each spirit flew back to stand before us. Eat, Anna, the Lord said. I ate the blue salt. It was good. He continued, this covenant of salt is for the heavenly realm. The spirits seemed exceedingly pleased to have represented heaven in helping to make this covenant. Thank you, my dear friends, Jesus said, and they bowed deeply from the waist, then disappeared. Come, Anna, the Lord said, rising. He helped me to stand. I picked up the bouquet instantly. It became a large emerald, and I blurted out a laugh because it startled me. For your crown, Anna, he said. Oh, thank you, Lord, I smiled in return, although as with my father, I did not know to what crown he was referring. How do you spend so much time with me, I asked. It's my job description, he laughed. He held out his hand to me, saying, come. I gave him my hand and we began to rise from the nest. As we rose, I saw an unscrolled scroll, unrolled scroll with writing on it. And it extended from heaven to earth and then back to heaven again. And it formed a huge wheel touching earth and heaven. We rose right beside it. I've never seen this, Lord, I said. The everlasting gospel made visible, Anna, he said. Proclaimed in heaven, fulfilled on earth. Proclaimed on earth, fulfilled in heaven. Come. Come. Chapter 5, The Pool of Reflection. After we arrived in paradise, I found that I was sitting alone near a clear round pool of water. On the opposite side of the pool, shrubbery was growing in geometric shapes, squares, rectangles, triangles and circles. These shapes were reflected perfectly within the pool. Scacte was blooming behind the geometric shrubs and each of these bushes was covered with waxy white blossoms that gave a mild, pleasant fragrance. I remember that stacti was a spice used in the holy incense, but I could not remember the meaning inherent in its name, and it was usually still by the pool, like being in the eye of a hurricane. I swung my legs around, putting my feet into the water, and they hardly made a ripple. Strange. Where am I? I asked aloud. The pool of reflection, a child's voice answered from behind me. Uh Uh-oh, I said within myself before, because I recognized the voice. Crystal clear, I smiled faintly as I turned to her, to face her. There she stood, her hair still tousled as if from play. She was wearing the same pale shift and pinafore. She looked five or six years of age. However, she had old eyes. At times I could see through her arm or leg, and she was a spirit. You have come back to see us, she exclaimed cheerily. We... L-O-V-E, love you, she continued, spelling out the word love as if it were in a child's song. I sighed painfully within myself as I remembered the last time I had seen her, but I thought perhaps this time will be different. I decided to ask her about the pool. What is the pool of reflection? It's a place where you can see yourself very clearly, she said. I was not sure that I liked that idea. Does one wish to reflect upon oneself? I asked coolly my flesh, suddenly rising up and being as shy, legalistic and as evasive as the flesh always is. She continued as though she did not notice. You might want to take a look to see if you are cooperating with God or resisting him. Do you want to look into the pool? She asked brightly. The decision. Of course I do not want to look into the pool. However... I was beginning to hear in my own voice, as well as in the hardness of my heart, my resistance to correction. Shortly before arriving at the pool, I was telling the Lord that I would give up anything and everything in order to gain more of Him. And now with my first opportunity to allow this declaration to become experiential in my life, I was balking. Do you think I should look? I asked limply. It might help, she replied. 
And with a sigh, I took my feet out of the water and I lay down on my stomach to look into the pool. I was amazed. I saw Jesus' face reflected in the water instead of my own. But there were geometric objects stuck onto his head and face. What are these objects? I asked. Blocks, she said. You are blocking him. They make the face of Jesus look really ugly. How do I get them off? I asked with an alarm. (laughs) She leaned over to look at my face in the pool. Hmm, she said as if making a diagnosis. You need to unstick the glue. Unstick the glue? I asked. How do I do that? Repentance, she said, matter-of-factly. Repentance unsticks the glue? She pulled back to look at me directly instead of at my reflection. I set up to look into her face. She shook her head from side to side as children do when correcting one another. Speaking in a slow, sing-song manner, she said, You're too old to play with blocks. Before I could answer her, she vanished. The small, strong smell of Stacti flooded the area. I looked at the bushes and the fragrant gum was running down the branches. Truth with mercy, I said glumly, remembering now the inherent meaning within the name. With a sigh, I turned back to the pool. I looked into the water again. The face and therefore the life of Jesus was definitely blocked from flowing to others. I gathered the courage to look at the blocks more closely. Each had writing on it. I squinted to decipher the lettering. Hypocrite was written on one block. Hypocrite, I said with self-righteous indignation. Although indignant, I dared not try to refute this because I knew it to be true. And that which people on earth might not see was plainly visible in heaven. And perhaps I might hide this from others, but I could not hide it from myself or from God. I am a hypocrite, I said, and you see it. And I say that I am doing what I do out of obedience, not caring about the results, but I do care. I care greatly. I want success. I want to feel that I am accomplishing something. I could not look at that block any longer. I decided to look at another block. Money was written on it. Oh no, I moaned. Well, it is true. I say that I do not mind being poor, but I mind a great deal. I do not like being poor. I know that to live by faith pleases you and I want to please you. But truthfully, it is easier to talk about faith than to live by it. At times I think if I just had enough money, I would never need to think about money again. And my confession made me uneasy. I decided to look at another block. Being a star was written on this block. My hands went to my face in embarrassment. True again, I confessed. It is difficult for me to live a hidden life. I want respect. I want honour. I want to be known. I want, I almost said glory. And as I confessed this sin, I was struck by the seriousness of it. Oh God, help me, I said. I want your glory. I shook my head. This is serious, very serious. How have you taken me as far as you have taken me? How can you love me? How can you want me to be your son's bride? In my spirit, I know that I want to be on the inside, that which I present on the outside. I know that I want to live by faith. I want that pride. I know that pride is a great sin. Satan wanted your glory. How am I better? Saying that galvanized my thinking. I am in a better place before you, Father, for my Lord the Savior died to release me from the penalty of death due to sin. And I plead the blood of Jesus before you and I ask that you forgive me for every sin as well for every transgression. And I can claim, proclaim to you that the Holy Spirit was sent to apply the cross to every act of flesh within me. I'm in a better place. And then, then Daddy, I cried, I ask for correction by the Holy Spirit. I ask for the cross. I ask that I be clean inside and out. I want the life of Jesus to flow through me unhindered. I mean, Daddy, that I do not want one hindrance. I give you permission to bring me into a pure walk before you. I know it will hurt, I know it, but I give you permission to ignore my whining. (laughs) Oh God, do not leave me as one dead, I began to cry. Forgive me, wash me clean with the blood of Jesus. He who paid the ultimate price with his shed blood and death on the cross so that I might stand before you clean in his righteousness. I continue, deal with my flesh, override my protests, discount my whimpering, 
please, please do not let me go around this mountain one more time. I do not want to live a half-hearted life, compromising at every turn because I do not want the pain of the cross. I wept bitterly and I miss Jesus, I cried. I'm in pain when we're apart. I realized suddenly that a very bright angel was near me, catching in an alabaster bottle every tear that I cried. The tears would start down my cheek and then automatically, obediently, even go into the vial. I was fascinated. I was so fixed upon this sight that I jumped a little when my name was caught from behind me. It was Judy, the angel of praise. She was dressed in a gossamy green under tunic bound with a golden girdle. Over this was a deeper green cloak that had long oversized sleeves. These sleeves contained pockets that held all manner of gold and musical instruments. Her neck, hands and feet had a slight tint of gold. Her auburn hair was plaited into seven loops, interlaced with gold. On her forehead was a small golden box housing scripture. She began to speak. Anna, rejoice that you are loved. I am sent to comfort you with the mantle of praise. What is that? I asked, wiping my eyes with my hand. The bright angel with the vial of tears disappeared. Shh, she said, putting her finger to her lips. Let me help to calm your soul. Rest. She began a small green whirlwind, and the wind and movement caused all the instruments within her robe to play together. The sound of praise was so pure that it seemed to draw angels from the air. They gathered in a large circle around her. She began to sing. O great I am, eternal one, fountain of life within the sun, wellspring of blessing and wellspring of light, infinite mystery hid from our sight. Searched by the spirit revealed through the sun, mystery unfolding, though ever begun, beginning and ending, great circle of light that shatters the darkness, confounding the night. All beauty, all joy, all splendor in one, his grace freely shared through the life of his son, his life and his death and his life evermore, though crucified ever to die nevermore. All hail, great Redeemer, all hail, mighty King, of life and of truth and of light do we sing, all praise, adoration and thanksgiving, through time never ending our homage will bring. As she sang the aroma of gold arnum, the cassia filled the air. Gold Arbonum bespeaks worship, adoration, thanksgiving and praise and Cassia urges homage to God alone. I needed both. I needed the idols in my heart to be cast down. Also, I needed to be lifted up out of myself through turning my eyes towards him in praise. Her song was like a mantle dropping upon me, lifting my spirit but settling my soul. At the end of the song, the many angels that had gathered withdrew discreetly. Judy spoke. Worship God, Anna. He alone is worthy, and then she too disappeared. I was alone again, but the stillness near the pool was no longer a vacuum. It was closer to the stillness within my soul. The Lord had accomplished a work within me, and although I did not know the nature of the work or how he had accomplished it, but I felt that I could see more clearly and that in some way I was different. The answer seemed simple, and Jesus overcame the flesh when he walked the earth. Now he could overcome the flesh in me. He would work, and I would rest in him. I felt cleansed, washed with my soul as still as the round pool before me. However, the stilling of my soul made room for a greater longing for him. The ache within my spirit had grown painfully acute. I missed him. Oh, I wanted to be with him. The pain was becoming a racking hunger. Suddenly, two angels came strolling down the path near the pool. They looked like young men of about 25 years of age. One had brown hair and wore a brown robe, and the other had blonde hair and wore a blonde robe. And There was something comical about them, but I did not know why I felt this way at all, and salt and pepper came to mind when I looked at them, and they were laughing and talking. Hello, I said. Who are you? Sense, bowed the angel in the brown robe. Nonsense, bound the angel in the blonde. What? I laughed. God is not into nonsense. Ah, oh, yes, said nonsense. There is more understood by the spirit than the mind, and much that the mind is given to comprehend as true, sense added. That reminds me of a song, said nonsense. Oh dear, said sense. We'll sing it for you, added nonsense. We will, our sense. 
Why not? replied Nonsense. You always like my songs. I do. Sense asked incredulously. They certainly are better than yours, Nonsense quipped. Yours sounds like math problems. Sense roared with laughter. All right, all right, he said. You start it. Nonsense sang. What is it to li- like to live above? What is it like above? Walk blind, you see. Walk deaf, you hear. And that's what it's like above, above. And that's what it's like above. There was a long pause. <laughs> is that it? Sense asked. Well, I'm not singing an aria here. Nonsense answered. <laughs> that is it. There was another long pause. I like it. Sense said wholeheartedly. Thank you, Nonsense said begrudgingly. Shall we sing it together? Ah, oh, very well, Sense nodded. Would you like to join us, Anna? If I can remember it, I said. Ah, oh, just jump in when you can, Nonsense added. Nonsense began to sing the song again, and we joined in when we could. When the song ended, Nonsense asked, shall we sing it again? Laughing, Sense said. I said, by all means, Sense continued. Come, Anna, we will walk with you down the path. We began to walk and sing the song again, and we sang it again and again and again. And the more we walked and sang, the funnier everything seemed. We all began to laugh uproariously. In fact, we laughed so much that we could hardly stand. At times we had to hang on to one another just to remain upright. Your songs are better than I remembered, roared Sense. We almost all fell down laughing because the song was true, but absolute nonsense. We walked and sang and laughed until we neared a large, verdant garden, the entrance to which was guarded by two enormous cherubim. We leave you here, said Sense. I wanted to ask where, but before I could ask, Nonsense said, whenever you need a little travelling music, just let us know. They bowed, laughing, and were gone. I was left on the path leading to the garden, and just ahead of me was a sign in the shape of an arrow pointing to the entrance. The lettering on the sign read, The Garden of God. (laughs) Chapter 6, The Garden of God. The brief reprieve of laughter had vanished with sense and nonsense. The dull ache of longing returned. It was becoming acute, alarmingly so. It was multiplying, galloping in intensity. I had asked to desire the Lord more than life itself. I did not realise that receiving such love would be excruciatingly painful. It was as though a javelin had been driven through my stomach. I could not pull it out. I was skewered with longing. But I pushed forward toward the garden, and perhaps I would see Jesus there. He and he alone was my cure, and that I knew. The angel Elijah Suddenly, the venerable angel Elijah joined me on the path. He was large, old-looking and slightly blue because of a blue light emanating from him. He had a partially bald head and a very long white beard. He wore a full-length sleeveless mantle woven with various shades of blue. Underneath this cloak was an even deeper blue robe. Light flashed within the mantle as if... It, in a distant thunderstorm, was raging within the fabric. Earlier, my heavenly father had assigned this angel to travel with me for the remainder of my life on earth, and he had become a friend. Elijah, I smiled, acknowledging him. May I walk with you, he asked. Please do, I replied. He did not address the pain I was experiencing, for which I was grateful, and as we walked, he began to speak. Life in the Spirit is being known intimately and knowing intimately, trusting the Beloved One, preferring the Beloved One, thinking of the Beloved One, honouring the Beloved One, holding the Beloved One to your heart. He looked at me as he continued, Your Heavenly Father has provided marriage on earth to demonstrate the bond of growing love between the loved ones, maturing in love, deepening in love, not seeking to expose but to nourish, being vulnerable to the beloved and tender toward others. He continued, Because our great and mighty God has created all, all has dignity. The one new love is mercy poured like warm oil on the wounds of the world, the balm of Gilead. The anointed one gave himself for all, for he has compassion on all, and though few will cling to him. We approached the entrance to the garden. It had no walls around it. However, it looked as though it grew up 
to an invisible wall and then stopped. We stopped before two large cherubim that flanked the entryway. Each cherub had two faces. One cherub had the face of a man in front and of a lion in the back. The other had the face of an eagle in front and of an ox in the back. Each cherub had two wings and hands under the wings. Their legs were straight like a man's but ended in hooves. Torp coloured feathers covered their bodies like fish scale mail. They were full of eyes around their bodies and within their wings. They were fearsome looking creatures. The cherubim bowed to Elijah. The face of the man asked, How are you this blessed day in the kingdom of our God? And then the four faces of the two cherubim burst into song. Bless his name forever and ever. And they were quartered. Elijah spoke to them. I'm accompanying Anna into the garden. Welcome, said the face of the eagle. And then the quarter sang, Praise him, praise him, all his handiwork. Elijah turned to me, Shall we go, Anna? Yes, please, I answered. Splendor and majesty, glory and honor are yours, O God, sang the cherubim. Their wings were raised and touching over the entrance. The eyes of all four faces were lifted in praise, and as we passed beneath their wings... My longing eased somewhat as we entered the garden. The Lord's presence was there, and we started down the path. The sound of praise from the cherubim grew fainter and deeper. We went into the garden. The area was bountiful. It looked as though every variety of tree, shrub, flower, and herb grew within its circumference. The fruit-bearing trees had flowers and leaves and were so heavy with fruit. I was in awe. I was walking in the original of the garden that graced earth at the dawn of creation. I said to myself, and this is the way it smelled, I added, because of the deliciously intoxicating aromas. Is the garden still on earth? I asked Elijah. No, he answered. It was carried away with the flood. Why the cherubim at the entrance? I asked. To join in the hymn of praise rising from this place to your father, he said. Listen. It was as though everything within the garden was given a voice with which to sing in unison. The sound was not loud, and I needed to still myself to hear it. It blended like music coming from all that made up the garden, all that reflected Christ. Sweet music, I said. (laughs) Sweeter still because it comes from the heart of him who is beyond compare. It comes from the heart of Jesus, he added. The garden was cool, not sticky as I would have imagined with so much foliage. We passed some small waterfalls and hidden pools. The rose of Sharon grew near the water. Does Jesus walk here? I asked Elijah. Yes, he smiled. This is his garden. He walks here. It is very beautiful, I said. Yes, he agreed. The life breath of God, the garden of Jesus. We came to a clearing in what I supposed to be the centre of the garden. The rose of Sharon grew around its perimeter. In the centre of this meadow grew a large bright tree. It was the shape of a many-branched oak tree or a very large apple tree. The branches were heavy with fruit and it shone with so much light that it was not the colour of a tree on earth. Elijah gestured toward it as we moved into the clearing. The tree of life, he proclaimed. I'll take my leave of you now, Anna. Oh, Elijah, I exclaimed. He turned to face me. Remember, Anna, that in that which is to come, remember that you are loved, he said. In the past I had found that such statements did not more to stand my hair on my end than to comfort me. This time was no exception. Remember, he said again, kissing my hand. He vanished. Seemingly, I was alone in the garden. I looked around the clearing. A slight breeze stirred the flowers and grasses in the meadow. I began to walk toward the tree of life. When halfway to the tree, the Lord materialized before my eyes. He stood before me, beaten and bruised. His garments stuck to his wounds that were still open, gouges in his skull, swollen fingers and swollen face. I cried out in alarm. I did not know what to do or how to help. I was in shock. I sank to my knees. For all the strength left me, my hands covered my face. Anna, he said, this is your husband too. 
I still bear wounds from that, from the faithless in the world. Oh, I couldn't look at him. It's all right, Anna, he said. It's all right. He took both of my hands into his and he helped me to rise. Look at me, Anna, he continued. He had changed and now looked as I usually see him. I am both what you see and what you saw. You need to know that you are marrying into both, one but both. I don't know what to say, I whispered. Say nothing, you said. What is there to say? But you need to know me as both so that you do not wed blindly. So what does that mean, I asked. Those who are one share all, he said. You wish to drink deeply, to share fully, to know even as you are known. This too is part of the knowing, the sharing, the being one. There are not many who turn from their own interests to seek the interests of God, but those who are called and chosen to live in God desire to share the sufferings of the Godhead. It was as though I was struck dumb. He continued, I realize that you're in shock, and therefore I will not ask you now if you are willing to share my sufferings, my sorrows. Lord, I said, trying to face the reality of what I had seen, make me willing. I want to be one with you. I'll deny you nothing, nor would I turn away from you because there are sorrows to bear, as long as we're together. Do you mean this, he asked. Yes, Lord, I said. Behold, he exclaimed, turning to face the tree of life and gesturing in its direction. A huge gold ring began to spin before us. It was as tall as the Ferris wheels that are part of the world's fair exhibitions on earth. It spun rapidly, bursting into flames. I realized that the flames were fiery seraphim, hundreds, no thousands of them. Their flames were as intense as blow torches, but a, a, a fi- but a figure similar to a man's was at the core of each torch. Each seraph had six wings. With two they covered their eyes, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. A unique and pure music came from their mist. Who will ride the wheel of fire? The seraphim called. Their voices had a strange sound, as if their words were passing through some medium to which we were not accustomed on earth. I realized I would need a greater spiritual maturity than I now possessed if I would desire to share the burdens of God. I did not know what this would mean, but evidently this fire was a first step if I wished to such maturity. And I turned to Jesus. I want to ride the wheel, my Lord. And he smiled. We'll ride it together. I called to the seraphim. We will ride. Jesus took my right hand and we started forward. And the closer we came to the wheel, the hotter grew the flames which burned. And the sound of thousands of blow torches were formidable. But through the flames I could hear an adoration of God that was of such purity that it startled my senses. As we arrived at the fiery wheel, a seraph beckoned for us to enter the flames. The seraph spoke to me. Few wish to ride the ring of fire. They want the ring of gold, but not the ring of fire. I looked at Jesus, and then holding tightly to his hand, we both entered the fire. It was extremely hot among these flaming seraphim. A seraph gestured for us to sit down, and we did, and the wheel began to turn, and we went up as if the fiery ring was actually a huge ferris wheel. And Jesus said, The seraphim will train you in a holiness that will bring forth pure worship, holiness burning like a torch intense in its focus. If you will yield to the ministry of these servants, you too will be like a flame and burn like a torch of love and purity for your God. He continued, the fire is for all. Learn to live in the fire by allowing it to burn away all that will not pass through as purely of me. Learn to love the fire of God. As the wheel climbed, it seemed as though I could see the entire universe, the beyond of beyond. A seraph flew to me with a live coal and he placed it on my lips and tongue. The fire burned across my face and down my throat into my heart. The seraph said, let your words be fewer and only those that come from the throne. The smell of the calamus and the cinnamon was intense within the flames. I knew the calamus means upright in God's sight. Cinnamon bespeaks the smell of holiness that comes from a pure heart before God, holiness of heart. The thousands of seraphim sang, Let all in heaven, let all on earth proclaim his holy name. 
Let all in heaven, let all on earth speak of his glory and fame. A wall of fire around our hearts, a wall of fire around our minds, a wall of fire around our feet. Holy is his name. I looked at Jesus, and the more they sang, the more light poured through their skin. Your skin, I said, it is so different. It is though light comes from it. Light does pass through my skin, he said, but Anna, light can pass through your skin too. For those who draw near to me are light bearers. The nearer they come, the more light passes through their skin to others. Like Moses, I asked. I thought to myself of how separated his life become. And Moses would go alone to the tent of meeting, alone to the mountaintop, alone with a veil eventually over his face because of the glory of God upon his countenance. The Lord read my thoughts. There is a separation that occurs, Anna. As one draws closer to God, there is a burning away of the dimness over the eyes of the mind and the eyes of the heart. And for these, the world loses its lusters. The ingenuity ingenuity of mankind becomes a passing spectacle that only causes the person to turn with a sigh back to God. He continued, When the truth comes, that which is not but a copy, but a reworked speck of a magnificent whole, cannot hold that person's interest. God alone can capture their spirits, hearts, souls, and bodies. As the fiery wheel reached its zenith, Jesus began to praise the Father. The seraphim burned more brightly in response to his adoration. O incomparable Father, who or what is like you? The vast universe is held in existence by the might of your power. Each hair is numbered because of your tender compassion. Who is like your Father? How awesome in majesty. How faithful in covenant. Unsurpassed in beauty. Blessed are those who draw near to you. Blessed are those who dwell in you. They will forever praise you and minister to you the desires of your heart. Love undivided, burning in the zeal of holiness, suitable for God alone. And those who draw near, those who enter, they will never go out again. And he was transformed into pure worship before me. It was as though he could not help himself and once began he could only enter in more deeply express his love more passionately burn more intensely the passion of his ardor came from complete understanding it was love and praise that sprang from knowledge such that can only come from a complete union can bring forth and as i watched he had passed into an ecstasy of love and passion that was incomprehensible to me The intensity and purity of his expression, his all-consuming zeal for his father, was so far beyond my understanding that it was wholly other. He burned with a laser white light. By being with him, I was carried further in my own passion and zeal for God. It was as though the alabaster vial had been broken for the smell of costly spike now had accompanied this spiraling upward. He became pure, uncreated light. Eventually the white flame of his ardor for his father subsided like the intensity of a powerful light being reduced. He became the Lord I could comprehend. Love God, Anna, he said. He has invited you into his heart. Do not treat this this as a trivial invitation. The wheel of fire stopped at the apex of its rotation and suddenly Jesus became the white eagle. Climb onto my back, he said. I did so, lying down and putting my arms around his neck, and as I had done many times, and then from the top of the wheel he began to fly. The time has come, he said. Chapter 7, The Valley of the Shadow of Death The great white eagle plunged through the darkness. I held on to him with all my might, burying my face in his feathers and keeping my eyes tightly shut. With all that was within me, I concentrated on clinging to him. Although the dive was as harrowing as dropping miles in a vertical, greased chute, the white eagle landed gently in the sheepfold within the second heaven. This dark, dank, spiritual realm is populated with demons of great grotesqueness. It is Satan's headquarters. Within this corrupted spiritual territory, our Lord retains an outpost, his sheepfold. It is a safe haven for his own. A stone wall encloses the protected area. The wall is topped with thorns as it might be if it were actually a desert sheepfold. 
A covered, though open, shelter and one wooden bench are within the wall, and there is one gate only into this protected area. And although surrounded by defiling contamination, the sheepfold remains inviolate. The white eagle became Jesus. Strangely, he said nothing. Instead, he handed me a pair of purpoise shoes dyed red. I had worn those shoes before when the Lord had taken me into this territory. Now I sat down on the bench near the gate and began to put them on my bare feet. I was puzzled. And he too sat down and he began putting on a pair. As he put on the shoes, he spoke. I asked you once before, Anna, and now I ask you again, do you trust me? Yes, Lord, I answered. My reply was given with less assurance than the first time he had asked. I realized that before I had not lived up to my own expectations, and now at least a grain of humility had been refined in me from the greater knowledge of my own frailty. I have need of you, he said as he rose to his feet. His shepherd's staff appeared in his right hand, and with his left hand he reached down to help me rise. He looked solemn, and when you were here before I warned you to touch nothing, and now I tell you to speak nothing. Walk straight ahead, straight ahead of you, and when requested, do only that which I indicate to you. He searched my face. Anna, he said, carefully follow my instructions. He spoke with a quiet intensity that suggested great, perhaps fatal, danger. I nodded, and the gravity of his words made an audible reply impossible. As he had opened the gate, he exhaled and a breath as if centering himself before a trial. We went out. The gate closed behind us. I was nervous. I followed in his footsteps, holding on to the back of his garment. I expected to see what I'd seen before when we visited this diabolical place. I did not. Instead, we began a dark descent. I could feel something sliding past my feet on the path. Primitive revulsion made me try to get my feet out of the way, and after my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could see by the light emanating from Jesus that vipers were slithering all over the wet incline. I momentarily froze, losing my grip on the Lord's garment. I could not call to him. All I could do was move forward, and by his light I could see that the snakes fled from Jesus, but would they flee from me? Everything within me was becoming fragmented. I knew that I had to center my focus. I stopped looking down. Instead, I fixed my eyes on the Lord. And now I could not see the snakes, but still I could feel them slither past me. I walked haltingly. Every part of my body was tense, almost rigid. Suddenly, I heard a familiar sound. It was our dog barking with excitement, and as if he had heard me coming. We raised this dog from the time he was a puppy. He was greatly loved. Instinctively, I turned my head in the direction of the welcoming bark. And just as quickly, however, I snapped it back to fix my eyes on Jesus. And I knew that the darkness and the slippery incline had disorientated me. I was trying to keep my attention centered. And then I heard the sound of a speeding vehicle coming toward the sound of the dog's welcoming barks. The wheels of the vehicle squealed, as if to make an emergency stop. And there was a bump, a sickening thud, and then the sound of the dog yelping as if it had been hit. I stopped again, catching my breath in short gasps, my ears straining to hear the location of the sound. It sounded as though the dog was crying in pain, but because of his love for me, he was still trying to drag himself to me. It tore my heart out. And then I heard my mother cry out. Her voice sounded near the dog's yelps. Help, help, she cried. And my breath almost stopped as I strained to hear. I could not call the Lord. Help the dog, Anna, my mother's voice cried out. Suddenly my emotions, which had been scattered as a frightened bird, loosed from a cage, snapped into a steely lucidity. And Satan had overplayed his hand. The voice that had sounded like my mother's had called me Anna. My real mother would not have called me that because on earth my father and mother had named me Anne. So everything had happened so quickly that I did not have time to think. Satan had bypassed my mind and engaged my emotions. But it was a lie, a lie. I began to move forward again with tiny frozen steps. With recognition of the deception, the sound ceased. 
but I was shaken from having my emotions shredded. And Jesus was ahead of me, but the distance between us was widening, and I needed to move more quickly to catch up with him. Inwardly, I began to quote scripture. Unless you hate your father and mother, I said, seeking to move more swiftly. And suddenly, the small snakes became huge ones. I shuddered within myself. Oh, Lord, I hoped that Jesus would turn around. These pythons had lettering on them, symbols or formulas. One gigantic snake reared up to fling itself at me, to knock me down. I knew that if it knocked the breath out of me, it could wrap itself around me and squeeze the life out of me. Divination, I said within myself. Witchcraft, sorcery, the powerful black arts. Shock and fear scrambled my mind. I dared not scream or dodge its lunge. The incline became steeper and slicker. I did not know if I could keep my footing. The snake lunged, barely missing me. And then three or four huge snakes reared up at the same time to lunge. I was frozen on the path, terrified. Suddenly, horrible mutilations flashed into my mind in rapid succession. It was as though I was being dismembered and disemboweled. Pictures of horrible tortures assailed me, mixed with visions of being buried alive or falling from a plane. Swiftly, the horrific pictures fled from before my eyes. In their place, the huge snakes became giant, demonic beings richly attired. They spoke to me. There is greater power than you have ever dreamed of having. Power, they said together. You can have anything you want. You can take it with this power. They must have showed me the mutilations that will occur if I refuse their offer of demonic power. I said within myself, they want to terrify me, paralyze my mind. I steeled myself. I will not be afraid of them. I continued to inch forward. I will not be intimidated. With myself, I began to repeat, not by might, not by, my, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And they were riding the steep path. I was getting closer to them. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The large demons were right ahead of me. I braced myself and I kept moving ahead. Incredibly, I passed right through them. I was perplexed. Oh, they are phantoms, I said within myself. Not real at all. They are a trick of the mind. I did not want to lose this clear understanding for Satan had managed to take clarity and perspective away from me in this place. And since I was seeing more clearly, I began to repeat the word of God within myself again. I moved ahead more rapidly now that the presence of mind had been restored. I dared not call to Jesus. I needed to remember that. However, Jesus began to move ahead more quickly than I could keep up. He was disappearing into the darkness of the valley ahead of me. And I wanted to cry out and run to him, but I remembered his admonition. And surely he will sense that I have fallen behind, I said within myself. Surely, I repeated frantically within I continued to place one foot ahead of another. And now, however, I was in total darkness, black, no light, no sound, nothing, nothing. Blackness is terrifying. It is the kind of terror that makes you want to scream just to relive the tension you are experiencing. I felt that I was suffocating with no escape. Evil pressed in on me. I began to talk to myself within, trying to cling to a measure of sanity. Any minute I will see his light ahead of me, I thought. No, nothing. I was groping with my feet on the dangerous incline. I had to remain upright. I was alone. I could not sense his presence at all. I prayed within myself, and the prayers were as heavy as stone. I quoted the word within myself, but it seemed to have no power. Oh God, I thought, don't leave me. And suddenly I caught myself. No, I said within, I will not accuse him of leaving me. I will not feel abandoned. For the child of God who loves the light, darkness is torturous. For those accustomed to his presence, his absence is excruciating. I thought in my Lord's agony on the cross and he must have experienced his blackness. Only he had all the sins of the world upon him. Cruel demons must have released to torture him must have been released to torture him. I began to confess within myself the benefits of the blood of Jesus and the victories he had won through his broken body. I testified within myself 
to myself of the attributes found within him and of the victories won by him. Somehow dishonoring God became more heinous and perishing. I did not want to put the Lord to open shame. I did not want to crucify him to myself again. I did not want to cry out and disobey in this place where the enemy could win a victory and laugh at him to scorn again. No, I said within, no accusations, no bitterness, no more wise, no more a need to be pampered. By his grace, I will walk the course he needs me to walk. Him, not me, his honor, not my safety, his glory, not mine, him, him. He alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. Oh my God, I sobbed within. I love you so much. What does this matter? And though you slay me, yet will I trust you? What does it matter if I live or die? I am yours. That's all that matters. I love you beyond danger or mayhem or darkness or death. Suddenly, my heart cracked open. I was unable to continue the love that I now felt. I burst free from what I did not know. It was as though love for the Lord had loosed me from a prison as though I had pulled away from the gravity of the flesh. I loved him. I loved him more than I wanted to preserve myself. It was a strange, exhilarating experience. It was as though I was loosed from self. Not that I did not realize even then that the cross would need to be applied to my flesh nature daily to hold it in the place of death, but something had happened. I had broken free. No longer would it be easy to embrace the flesh. I would need to work deliberately at employing the flesh now, whereas before it had seemed inevitable. And now I was being drawn into the orbit of the Son of God. I could already feel myself moving toward him more rapidly. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus was the new gravity that was drawing me into God himself. Love like a river began to rush through my heart. Love unhindered, unstoppable and unimaginable. Quickly, a tiny speck of light appeared in the path ahead of me. I made the calculation that if that light had been a little to the right or left, the darkness would have hindered me from seeing it. I continued to move forward. Within the light emanating from him stood Jesus. He was waiting for me in the valley, and as I drew nearer, he smiled and opened both of his arms. I seemed to cover the distance between us supernaturally and was in his embrace, and even within his arms I dared not speak, for he had requested this. He likewise said nothing. His embrace said it all. He within me, by the power of the Holy Spirit, had demonstrated his victory. The enemy did not entangle my emotions, corkscrew my mind, or pervert my will. Love, his love, was triumphant within me. There was little time to rejoice. However, for past his shoulder, I saw a very large black brooding in the wet darkness. Chapter 8, Satan's Trophy Room. Jesus held me at arm's length, studying my face. He smiled, turned, and led the way toward the building. The atmosphere in the valley was red as though the building was catching the light from a distant forest fire. It was eerie. It cast long shadows across the valley. The shadows travelled up the building until they reached two enormous black marble dragons on top. These dragons were facing each other with their wings uplifted and touching like the cherubim over the mercy seat. The building was a mockery of the Ark of the Covenant. It was deathly dark, as if it were made from uh, antimatter. The black marble exterior was wet, and the overbearing humidity made it difficult to breathe. Thousands of soldiers were standing shoulder to shoulder on all four sides of the building. They wore an ancient style of armor whose design I had never seen. And these warriors were camped around the building, just as the Levites were instructed to camp around the desert tabernacle. None of them moved when we passed through their numbers, however. Why, I wondered. I glanced down their ranks to see if I could discern the reason for their inaction. The faces within the helmets were shadow, but their eyes tracked us. I suddenly remembered how the two angels that were sent to rescue Lot had temporarily blinded the men of Sodom. Jesus, I thought, must have rendered these demons inert. They were alert, but they were incapable of action. They held their ranks like clay soldiers buried within early China em- Chinese emperors. 
After passing through most of the ranks of the soldiers, Jesus approached the building. The structure had the appearance of a gigantic Muslim. As we drew near, I could see that the black marble dragons were breathing, and so were the black marble monkeys that formed a decoration around the top of the building, and these leered down at us. The massive double doors unlatched as we approached. They opened slowly. Each door was of great weight, and they pictured Satan's supposed conquests. They were executed in bronze relief and were similar to the doors of European cathedrals that often depict the life of Christ. The doors opened outwardly to give us entry to a large windowless room. The smell within the room was odious. The room, like the valley, seemed lit by distant fires. My eyes travelled up to a heavy raised cornice. It formed a crown around the top of the room. A text was written upon it in ancient language of wedges and triangles. Jesus waved his hand and the lettering changed so as I was able to read the inscription. The text proclaimed Satan's five I wills, with which he intended to vault himself above the throne of God and crown himself king of the universe. I shuddered. Hanging upside down from this cornice were half female and half bat-like demons. The lilith, the vampire demons that hunt at night. They were repugnant. I dropped my gaze and saw the reason for the stench in the room. Baguano. Display tables flanked either side of the room and these were covered with what seemed to be black velvet. The objects on display were shining with light from within. The objects were beautiful, not because of the exquisite workmanship, not because they were encrusted with jewels. Instead, they seemed to have some beauty bestowed upon them by God. They were his, for his people had used them. And now they sat on the display like war mementos. I quickly glanced over the tables in astonishment. This was a trophy room. Each article was labelled with a claymaker. The same wedges and triangular-shaped writing was on these markers, as was on the cornice. Again, Jesus waved his hand, and the language changed so that I could read the labels. On display were the just measure, Miriam's tambourine, Bezalel's renderings for the workers, of the patterns given to Moses on the mount, the widow's bowl, various musical instruments of ancient design, and on and on. We passed article after article that had been used by God in some extraordinary way and then stolen from him. I could only suppose that these had been taken into the enemy camp because of the sins of God's people. I was heartened. However, by the empty spaces on the tables, the label showed articles that apparently had been rescued to be used by God's people again. Goliath's sword was, that was used by David was missing. David's harp had been retrieved. There was an empty space where once a banner had been displayed, and as we neared the rear of the trophy room, I saw a white embroidered robe on a black clothes stand. It was luminescent, and Satan had displayed it by itself as if it were a prized acquisition. Beyond this article, on the rear wall was a vivid fresco. Before the fresco burned black candles. The flickering lights from the candles seemed to give the fresco a life of its own. The fresco began its base with recounting after recounting of brutal tortures of some of God's people. Those being tortured still seemed alive. The fresco was like none I had ever seen. It was similar to a hologram. Light from the candles caused the pictures to have progressive action so that those suffering suffered again, with Satan supposedly gaining the victory again and again. It was barbarous. My eyes travelled up this mountain of slaughter to about one-third of the way to the ceiling. Here the fresco began to depict a mound of skulls. This mound rose to a throne of skulls upon which sat the goat-like legs of a satyr. The enthroned creature had the torso and arms of a human, but the head and horns of a goat. In this goat man's left hand was held a picture of the world, and in his other hand was the location for two keys. 
The outline of the keys was still there, but the keys of death of Hades had been removed from his hand. The fresco vaulted up until it covered the first half of the ceiling like a frightful canopy. It was Satan, goat-like, enthroned upon a monotonous, a mountainous pile of human skulls. He was gloating in sinister splendor, as God the Father is enthroned upon the praises of his people. Satan is enthroned upon his murderous savageries and sadistic cruelties. A chill ran through me. Flickering light from the black candles caused Satan's face to move, seemingly to change before my eyes. His snake-like eyes glared at me. Jesus touched my shoulder and I flinched. We began to walk toward the acquisition at the very back, the embroidered robe. It was full length with long sleeves. The design of the garment was simple. A man or woman could have worn it. Its riches lay in the embroidered work that was executed in white gold of exceptional purity. The embroidery arose from the robe. The pattern was intricate and exceptionally beautiful. And as I moved a little before the garment, all the colours within the radiance of the Father seemed to play across its surface. The weight and thickness of the various gold threads seemed to symbolise attributes of the Lord. The robe reflected these as if had been woven into the garment. I had no idea a garment could communicate that which was of the character of Christ. Still, I wanted to move slightly before the embroidery to ascertain what was woven into the fabric. I received the impression of a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. The garment also reflected bearing with one another and forgiving each other. The thread that had greatest weight and was the most frequently used was love. There were parts of the character of Christ that Paul enumerated in Colossians 3, 12 to 14. He had told the body of Christ alive at that time to put on this garment. And if he had told them to put it on, they must have had it in their possession but not, were not wearing it. And I gathered that sin had eventually allowed the garment to be taken from God's children. Sad, we had great need of it. And Jesus spoke to me quietly. The garment is for the soul and heart. It is an inner garment that becomes visible through actions, through decisions that affect unity, oneness in Christ. He continued, I am the new inner garment, others rather than self. The supreme other is God, the Father, himself, his rights, his needs and his desires before all. I have purchased you for our Father. I have washed you and clothed you with garments of holiness and beauty, garments of salvation and righteousness. And I clothe yourself in me, garments of salvation for the whole person, body, soul, heart and spirit. Clothe yourself in me, attributes of righteousness that are beautiful to God the Father. I turned back to look at the robe. It was exquisite. The Lord's virtues woven into the garment had brought the body of Christ into the perfect bond of unity. Paul had said this, how we needed it now. He continued the embroidered garment is to be worn by those who are the bride, and it was handed down in our family. And those who were entering into the fuller union with me wore it. There is none like it. It belongs to our household. As I looked at the robe, I realized that to enter into a deeper relationship with Christ meant to enter into a deeper covenant with his body. The two are inseparable. Carefully listen to me, Jesus said softly. I want you to remove the garment, then quickly climb onto my back. Without hesitation, he placed his hand on the top of the velvet clothes rack. I did not have time to think. Instantly, I obeyed and began to remove the robe. The more I disengaged the garment, the harder he pressed on the top of the rack. I suppose he was recompensating for some of the weight of the glory in it. He continued to press on the top of the rack as I folded the embroidered robe so that it could be carried. And when the garment had been secured, I looked at Jesus. He gave the flicker of a smile, winked at me, and then removed his hand from the rack. Screams, sirens and alarms of all kinds immediately arose together. All restraints were removed from everything within this realm. Quickly the Lord became the white eagle, and nervously I scrambled onto his back. The vampire bat demons unfolded their huge wings. Their eyes were blood red, and they hissed through their fangs, through their mouths, and they were deranged with fury. 
The doors to the front of the trophy room began to close. The white eagle had to fly with his wings perpendicular to the floor to pass through the narrow opening. I tightened my arms and legs around him, pressing the row between my flattened body and his back. We passed through the opening like a single unit. With searing screams, everything, bats, monkeys, dragons, soldiers, wrenched away. And it seemed as though everything in the corrupted satrum breathed down upon us in the chase, screeching, squalling, shrieking, a caphony of blood-curling sounds raised behind us. They were a frenzied juggernaut. The marble dragons wrenched free from the top of the building with all the crackling and tearing that accompany a structure being torn apart. The black marble monkeys violently ripped free to join in the hunt. The lilith and shadow warriors rapidly pursued. Whether hooved or winged, clawed, fightless or airborne, they pressed us. They were a murderous horde of frenzy and rage. Quickly demons from elsewhere in the second heaven joined these in the chase. The whole second heaven sounded like one dangerous wounded animal. The bone-chilling cries that went up from that place made my blood run cold. It was horrific. I clung to the white eagle. It was a wild ride, wild, but exhilarating. I threw my head back, gulping air and laughing silently. Let them roar. That was all that it was, a roar, a show. I was with Jesus and Jesus had won the victory. Let them roar. Suddenly there was a release of the fragrances of saffron and onicha. More costly than pure gold is the fragrance of saffron coming from the Lord's throat, for it is, symbolizes his faith. Onicha means raw, but it is the authoritative roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And these priceless fragrances released in the mid-heaven exhibited the Lord's overcoming victory. The white eagle flew to the sheepfold. My purple shoes dropped from my feet as he swooped through the single gate and began to climb upward. The demons outside of the wall wailed in fury. They'd be punished for allowing the garment to be taken. Both they and we knew this, and the Lord continued to fly upward. There were great strength in the beat of his wings, and the caterwauling became less distant as we pulled away toward the third heaven. While flying, he spoke loudly to me so that I could hear him. You'll wear this robe, Anna. It has been restored to the household of our father, and now many will wear it. With great power, he continued to climb upward. Almost laughing, he shouted to me, Something old. Chapter 9. Something borrowed, something blue. Swiftly, the white eagle flew to the throne room in the third heaven. As he descended to the sea of glass, I noticed that there was no one inside except my heavenly father. I knew that others had to be there but I could not see them. I climbed from the white eagle's back. Instantly he became Jesus. He grabbed me around the waist, picking me up and swinging me around several times. He was laughing. I too was laughing. We were breathless from excitement when he set me down. Come, he smiled, gesturing toward my father. He put his left hand at the back of my waist to escort me forward. I was still hugging the robe when he approached the throne. Jesus indicated that I should hand it to him, and I did. The Lord held it up, letting it unfold to its full length in all its lustrous beauty, and then he laid it on the sea of glass before our Father. The covenant garment had been returned, Father, he said. We both prostrated ourselves before it. I am pleased, my Father said. Place it in my hands. And we rose. Jesus lifted the garment to our Father's hands of light. God the Father received it. Cupping it in both hands as you would a baby chick. His hands became laser bright. I diverted my gaze. And when I looked again, the garment had disappeared. Thank you, my father said to me. Now, my sister, my bride, Jesus said. Stepping between my father and me, he turned to face me. Look at me, he said. I did. My father placed his hand of light on Jesus' shoulder. And then Jesus raised his right hand to my forehead. Light shot from his finger as he rode upon me. It was a strange feeling. I write upon you my new name, he said. Sealed.
said the Holy Spirit, who must have been present all along. I felt a stamped pressure over the area where Jesus had placed his name. Now I had two names on my forehead. My father had placed his name there when he asked me to be his chancellor, or secretary to a king. And Jesus smiled at me. Something new, he said. And now you have something new that you will wear forever. You are marked and sealed, my sister, my bride. My father removed his hands from the Lord's shoulders. Jesus took my right hand in his. I must go, he said, and when I return I will give you your heart's desire. This, my love, will seal your heart. He continued looking deeply into my eyes. He was so remarkably handsome, so beautiful in holiness, that at times it took my breath away. Anna, I'm coming soon, he said. He kissed my hand and he looked into my eyes again. Soon, he said, then disappeared. There was a pause as my father allowed me to savour all that the Lord had said to me. Eventually God the Father said, My child, come up here. He picked me up and he placed me on the armrest of the throne. Anna, who is beloved of my son, he said, I would not only feed you from my hand, but also I would feed you from my very heart. Purity and holiness are not words that describe my qualities. They are tangible in the person of my son. He is not a shadow or a reflection, but my heart manifested. He continued, The Spirit alone can understand this, for the Spirit comes from me and understands its own. The Spirit transcends all boundaries necessitated on earth. Its knowing is a pure knowing, because as in the giving of all such gifts, pure knowing comes from above. He held out his hand. Here, Anna, eat this. Not manna from above, I feed you from my very heart. His hand of light held in his, its palms something that looked like nothing. I could see nothing in his hand, and I looked forward toward his face area and then back to his hand, and suddenly the center of his hand burst into flame. The blaze shot up very high and then reduced to a small fire, and then the flame disappeared entirely. In the center of his hand of light were tiny smoldering nuggets. They were coals of smoldering light, if light could burn. Eat from my hand, he said. I leaned over and ate from his hand. My father seemed pleased, and I wonder why this gave him such joy. He spoke. It is my desire to raise up many white eagles, Anna, to raise up a bride who will love my son more than his or her own soul life. I desire to raise up a priesthood that will be incense in my nostrils, breathed in as a sacrifice and breathed out carrying life to others. I am your father. A father's greatest desire is to have children to whom he can give all. I have such a child in my only begotten son, but I long to raise up those of my adopted children who will draw near to me and will not be satisfied with less. And when such a one longs to eat from my hand, I am given much joy. Anna, he said, life in this household is a simple life. Meals around the family table concerned over family matters, joy over births into the family, the celebration of anniversaries, the sharing of labours side by side, simple. And I thought of the Lord's words, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. It was as though we needed to reach some saturation point in complexity before we were ready to turn and simply seek him. He continued, the splendor of my majesty lies in the depth of my love. Your feathers are white now, my eagle, he said. You are ready to nest above. He waved his hand to allow me to see an ivory palace on a high mountain. This is yours if you want it, he said. It's very beautiful, father, I said slowly, not wishing to seem ungrateful. But I smiled wistfully. I'd never be there. I'd always be away from home because I would want to be near you. You are my home, Daddy, just as you are my beloved's home. It's taken me a great deal of time to realize this, but now I know that there is nothing on earth or in heaven that I desire. I want only my Father. I want Jesus. I want my friend, the Holy Spirit. If I may live where I would be the happiest, allow me to live amid the coals of fire within you. Let me be a pillar in the temple of my God, never to go out again. And my Father gave me a small cry of pure joy. You have chosen, he said. 
and suddenly there was a release of the fragrance of aloes. I knew that aloes meant little tents, so named for the intimacy of the bridal tent chamber. I too had chosen in intimacy. I had chosen nearness to my God. I breathed in the fragrance, so did my father. It was satisfying. My father continued, Anna, my child, you will need to borrow your crown for the ceremony. You will wear it for this special occasion, but it will not be placed into your hands until the service on earth is completed. A crown of gold came from my heavenly father. He held it higher than my eye level. The crown had two gems. The large emerald that my father had given me was in the center. The slightly smaller emerald given to me by Jesus was on the side. There were golden sockets for other jewels. No other gemstones were present at this time, however. He continued, I have added to your crown 24 sapphires, and these immediately appeared, encircling the large emerald on the front. Thank you, Daddy, I said. I wondered how I merited these gems. My father answered my thoughts. You cannot earn the uncreated, he said, but you can grow up into Christ to manifest the uncreated. Something borrowed, he added, something blue. My father continued, and 24 stars attend this crown. They will bring to you the covenant garment, your crown and your veil, and these will dress you and attend you at the ceremony. I saw that the crown had 24 points around the top. I wondered if there was some connection between the points of the crown and the angelic attendants, but he did not give an explanation. Is there something that I need to do, Daddy? I asked. He answered, sleep with Hannah on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet as an outward sign of an inner grace. And my son is coming, he said. Be ready. Twenty-four angels that looked like young women appeared on the sea of glass and they were dressed in white. My father handed to them the crown, the covenant garment and the veil. The gown and veil also came from his own person. My child, the father continued, you have my blessing. His glory came from him and kissed my forehead. Thank you, Daddy, I said. He picked me up and he placed me in front of the 24 angels. Go with your attendants, he said. And we all bowed, and then the angels parted to allow me to pass through their number. They escorted me from the throne room. Instantly, we were walking across the meadow in the garden of God. We walked to the tree of life, and I was silent. I did not feel like talking. The angels were silent also. A very important event lay before me. But I did not know what it was or even how it would look. And once we reached the trunk of the tree, the attendants busied themselves applying henna paste to the palms of my hands and the soles of my feet. The air hung heavy with the smell of the spice. I held on to the tree that was strangely warm. I did not want to watch the angels because I was nervous, distracted. Wishing to encourage me, one of the angels said, Henna is the best of the spices. It faintly registered with me that I had been carried through Esther's preparations. And when the statement did break through to my consciousness, I thought, how right that I should enter the kingdom through the shed blood of Jesus. And now before this important event, an outward sign should be placed upon me. Within myself, I thanked the Lord for forgiving me. And then I continued aloud. I ask for forgiveness for any sin that I have committed. And I forgive everyone for sins committed against me. I looked at the angels. And it says in the word to confess your sins to one another. The angels looked bewildered. And then I realized that angels do not confess to one another. And I changed the subject. Does anyone know what I am to do here at the Tree of Life? <laughs> Rest, one angel said. You have experienced much. I laughed wearily. Yes, I affirmed. But I'm very excited and nervous. Resting in the Tree of Life will strengthen you, another added. We'll lift you into its branches, said another. Before I could think about it, they lifted me. They began carrying me upward, and it seemed as though the tree accommodated us, for we struck no branches. High in the trees, they lay me in a juncture that cradled me. It was very comforting to rest in its branches. And we will return when, we, when you have rested, an attendant said. Thank you, I smiled at them. And they were gone. I lay there looking up into the branches of the tree, thinking of my lover, my friend. The soft lights of the leaves and the fruit soothed. I did not think I could rest, but I did. And before falling asleep, I lifted my hands to look at them again. And I spoke quietly. Oh, my beloved, 
what is going to happen. Chapter 10, Consecration. Slowly my mind inched toward consciousness. I opened my eyes. Intense balls of light were hovering before my face. Within these lights were the outlines of spirits the size of hummingbirds. I was too mellow from slumber to be startled. Instead, I was bemused watching them. While I was looking at these spirits, angels below me in the garden began to sing. Amazingly, they were addressing the rocks, hills, trees and streams of the garden of God. Song of the 24 Attendants I let us hear you sing, O God, the great Almighty One, whose fire of burning holiness is seen within his Son. Come now, ancient hills, proclaim, and streams re-echoing, and rocks and grass and trees burst forth, together let them sing. His grandeur may more than these can tell, ancient though they be, while spanning time as if a day he eternity. But let them sing and let them tell, for they too would proclaim, they too would clap, they too would dance, they too would bless his name. O oh, ancient hills, what do you know? In trees, what will you sing? In rocks, what virtues you extol? In streams, what wisdom bring? O oh, let us hear you worship God, enlightened through your praise. Through your instruction, may we too behold with steadfast gaze his splendor born of purity, his bead feet grace, past or created, till like you we gaze upon his face. The song ended. I reached up with my light hand toward the spirits within the balls of light. They scattered and I sat up. Anna, an angel, called to me from beneath the tree. I peered down up to her upturned face and it was one of the attendants. We've come to take you to your consecration. All 24 of the white clad angels began to rise through the branches. They were standing on the air near the juncture in the tree where I had rested and they were smiling. Hello, I smiled back at them, thinking how odd it was that anything could stand on air. Hello, they answered, trying to contain their excitement. Are you ready to go? Yes, I answered. Suddenly my hands went to my face. Realization had rushed in on me. This was the one time for which I had been waiting, but waiting for what? And how would it be accomplished? Yes, I am ready, I reiterated aloud. I did not want to ask questions, I did not want to prattle, and this was much too serious and my love for Jesus much too intense. The angels helped me to rise. For a moment I was standing high in the tree of life with all of its shimmering leaves and fruit around me. Instantly we were in the temple complex. I received only an overall impression of the temple, for I was intent upon that which lay before me. And I saw neither side walls nor ceiling, and that I do remember. I wondered where the temple stood, but I did not ask. The angels escorted me to a sunken pool that contained moving water. The water flowed into the pool from an invisible source beneath the floor and flowed out again just as mysteriously. It was accessed by stairs that extended beneath the water's surface. The angels led me to the top of these stairs. Then they circled the pool, holding above their heads a long sheeting of white linen, and this portable curtain extended from their upraised hands to their feet, effectively providing privacy. And I wondered what this meant. I asked within, I had already been baptised after accepting Christ. I do not need to show again that I have passed from death into life, do I? And then I remembered that those being consecrated before embarking upon priestly duties passed through a washing. Perhaps I thought a cleansing precedes all major events in one's life, whether we know it or not. And even though I did not understand completely, I wanted to respond out of obedience to all that I believed the Lord was asking of me, and I determined to enter the pool. As I started to take my first step in faith, my robe disappeared. Carefully I descended the stairs entering the pool. And the water was about chest high. The cool, clear liquid flowed past me. It was soothing. I lowered myself completely beneath the water. And when I surfaced, I felt urged to bless the Lord aloud. I said, Blessed be the Lord God who cleanses us with the water of the word. Yes, I said to myself, absolutely amazed by the revelation given by the act of obedience that cleansing is continual. I turned around and ascended the stairs. The angels remained holding the white fabric above their heads and they gathered around me closely. 
Together we walked toward the large altar of burnt offering. I was still hidden within the linen enclosure, dripping wet. And the angels circled the bronze altar, holding the linen enclosure above their heads. I looked at the coals burning beneath the grate, and they were hot. Nothing was being offered upon this altar because our Lord was the sacrifice of the whole burnt offering on the cross. I looked at the burning coals. No one said what I should do. It must be a puzzle whose answers already I know. I said within myself, I began to think, if Jesus had paid the full price already, then the altar of the burnt offering is not something you go around. You must go through it. As strange as it was to me, I began to walk forward and I passed right through the bronze altar, coals, heat and all. Incredible. On the other side of the altar, my father's voice spoke audibly within the temple. Are you willing to live a life of purity sanctified to me alone? Yes, I answered aloud, and the Lord being my helper. The linen breeches, he said. Linen breeches appeared, and I stepped into them. I supposed that they were a sign of the salvation that had been won for me on the earth. The priests had worn these to cover their nakedness. And again my father spoke, Are you willing to be teachable, tender, pileable, to stand rightly before me? I will, Christ, being these through me, I said. The tunic, he said. A linen tunic dropped over my head from above. Again, my father spoke aloud. Are you willing to be, fa- to be made faithful? Are you willing to be made faithful? Yes, Lord, I answered. The sash, he said. A sash encircled me. And my father continued. Are you willing that the whole head representing the sea be for me alone? The mind of Christ, the sight of Christ, the hearing of Christ, the smelling and the tasting of Christ and the response to touch. Are you willing to be holy unto me alone with the covering of my son upon your head? Yes, Lord, I answered. The cap, he said. The white linen cap enfolded my head. Anointing oil was poured over my head. It ran down the garment to the hem. And suddenly blood appeared on my right earlobe, right thumb and right toe. It had to be the blood of Jesus, for his is the only blood in heaven. And the angels dropped the linen enclosure. It disappeared from their hands. The 24 attendants indicated that I should move forward. They did not go with me. And I, was, I moved forward, the weight of that which was won by Christ on the altar of the cross came onto my upturned hands. I could see nothing, but I felt this and I lifted my hands to wave his sacrifice before the Father. As I walked toward the entrance to the holy place, I heard the 24 elders and the four living creatures begin to sing. Bring forth the priest unto our God, he who sings as, sits as king. Loose your great power over the earth, that earth like heaven may sing. Holy God, our great delight, swallow sin in darkest night. Begin for mercy's sake the fight, O God, begin the end. Praise to the King who reigns on high, Zion above will sing. We hold before you bowls of prayers, they, their tribute to we bring. Release the seal that they may stand, first fruits here above. Blood washed in the blood of the Lamb, gifts of his intimate love. Our crowns we throw beneath your feet, eternal God of might. All power, love and majesty are yours, great God of light. Though standing still upon the earth, let them live above to join us in continual praise, consumed at last by love. And let them walk mid coals of fire. Hear great ye are our prayer. Let the circle be complete, O King beyond compare. Let them hear and let them speak to hallow your great name. Let your glory be visibly seen. Set their hearts aflame. Release the Lamb to open above the seal that seals the end, that righteousness with purest love might dwell on earth again. Holy God, our great delight, swallow sin in darkest night. Begin for mercy's sake the fight, O God, begin the end. Their song ended as I crossed the threshold to the holy place. The weight of the wave offering was lifted from my hands. As I passed into the holy place, I appropriated that was which was symbolized Christ there, the light of the golden lampstand, as well as the bread, wine, and the frankincense on the table of shoe bread. I came to the altar of incense before the holy of holies, because I had passed through the bronze altar. I felt that I must pass through this altar also, and it symbolized Christ's ministry of intercession. 
As I began to move through the altar, the aromas of the smoking incense clung to me, and I continued to move forward, lifting my hands. I passed the veil, which had been rent at the time of our Lord's death, and entered the Holy of Holies. The sprinkled blood of Christ's sacrifice was already on the mercy seat. The smoke of his fragrant intercession filled that chamber. The unburned spices of the incense that is most holy to the Lord were also present. Since Christ had paid the full price to gain our access to the Father, I passed through the Ark of the Covenant. On the other side of the Ark of the Covenant, the blood of Christ, as well as the holy anointing oil, was sprinkled upon me and upon the priestly garments. My heavenly Father spoke to me again. You are ordained and consecrated unto me this day, Anna, priest forever. There is a time of being shut away, however, before you assume your duties. The angelic attendants appeared after my father's admonition. And as my father had said, the 24 attendants brought to me the covenant robe, the veil and the crown. The headgear of a priest became eternal, internal. The breeches, tunic and the sash remained on me. As the angels prepared to dress me, one attendant said, You come to this union with nothing but the Son of God's cleansing, his sacrifice, his blood, his aromas and his anointing. Suddenly we heard the blast of a distant shofar. He comes, the angels said with much excitement. The horn blew again. Quickly they slipped the covenant robe over my head. The garment had the fragrance of myrrh, aloes and cassia. Mingled with these aromas were those of the spices of the holy anointing oil, of the holy incense and of the garden. Each aroma was intensified with the embroidered robe was worn. The fragrance was everywhere. I noticed that the palms of my hands were still stained red from the henna. I suppose that the soles of my feet were still stained also. The angels placed the borrowed crown of life upon my head. And together they raised the circular full-length veil. I thought that they would release it to float down upon me, and instead I realized that my Heavenly Father was veiling me by the power of the Holy Spirit. As it descended, he spoke a blessing over me. Become thousands of ten thousands, my child. Suddenly we heard a shout, and then Jesus called to me from a distance, Anna! I turned to look for him. He comes, the angel said excitingly. Immediately he burst into view. He was riding the most beautiful white steed I had ever seen. The horse was galloping at top speed. The sight of Jesus knocked the breath out of me. He was wearing a white with a gold crown on his head. He was very, every inch a king and every inch the desire of all nations. Without allowing the horse to break stride, he scooped me up and he pulled me onto the horse to sit in front of him. With his left arm, he held me securely to himself. The angelic attendants clapped and jumped, spinning around with joy. The white stallion began to climb up and up over the terrain of paradise. He galloped on the wings of the wind. It was glorious. And when we reached the sea of glass, the white horse began to descend. He came to a halt at the back of the throne room. All assembled raised a great shout of joy. And then cutting through the shout, one lone angel near the throne began to sing. Blessed is he who comes. Blessed is he who comes. Chapter 10. Consecration. Slowly my mind inched toward consciousness. I opened my eyes. Intense balls of light were hovering before my face. Within these lights were the outlines of spirits the size of hummingbirds. I was too mellow from slumber to be startled. Instead, I was bemused watching them. While I was looking at these spirits, angels below me in the garden began to sing. Amazingly, they were addressing the rocks, hills, trees and streams of the garden of God. Song of the 24 Attendants I let us hear you sing, O God, the great Almighty One, whose fire of burning holiness is seen within his Son. Come now, ancient hills, proclaim, and streams re-echoing. And rocks and grass and trees burst forth, together let them sing. His grandeur may more than these can tell, ancient though they be, while spanning time as if a day, he eternity. But let them sing and let them tell, for they too would proclaim. They too would clap, they too would dance, they too would bless his name. O ancient hills, what do you know? In trees, what will you sing? 
and rocks what virtues you extol and streams what wisdom bring. O oh, let us hear you worship God, enlightened through your praise. Through your instruction may we too behold with steadfast gaze his splendor born of purity, his beat at feet grace, past or created till like you we gaze upon his face. The song ended. I reached up with my light hand toward the spirits within the balls of light. They scattered and I sat up. Anna, an angel, called to me from beneath the tree. I peered down up to her upturned face and it was one of the attendants. We've come to take you to your consecration. All 24 of the white clad angels began to rise through the branches. They were standing on the air near the juncture in the tree where I had rested and they were smiling. Hello, I smiled back at them, thinking how odd it was that anything could stand on air. Hello, they answered, trying to contain their excitement. Are you ready to go? Yes, I answered. Suddenly my hands went to my face. Realization had rushed in on me. This was the one time for which I had been waiting, but waiting for what? And how would it be accomplished? Yes, I am ready, I reiterated aloud. I did not want to ask questions, I did not want to prattle, and this was much too serious and my love for Jesus much too intense. The angels helped me to rise. For a moment I was standing high in the tree of life with all of its shimmering leaves and fruit around me. Instantly we were in the temple complex. I received only an overall impression of the temple, for I was intent upon that which lay before me. And I saw neither side walls nor ceiling, and that I do remember. I wondered where the temple stood, but I did not ask. The angels escorted me to a sunken pool that contained moving water. The water flowed into the pool from an invisible source beneath the floor and flowed out again just as mysteriously. It was accessed by stairs that extended beneath the water's surface. The angels led me to the top of these stairs. Then they circled the pool, holding above their heads a long sheeting of white linen, and this portable curtain extended from their upraised hands to their feet, effectively providing privacy. And I wondered what this meant. I asked within, I had already been baptised after accepting Christ. I do not need to show again that I have passed from death into life, do I? And then I remembered that those being consecrated before embarking upon priestly duties passed through a washing. Perhaps I thought a cleansing precedes all major events in one's life, whether we know it or not. And even though I did not understand completely, I wanted to respond out of obedience to all that I believed the Lord was asking of me, and I determined to enter the pool. As I started to take my first step in faith, my robe disappeared. Carefully I descended the stairs entering the pool. And the water was about chest high. The cool, clear liquid flowed past me. It was soothing. I lowered myself completely beneath the water. And when I surfaced, I felt urged to bless the Lord aloud. I said, Blessed be the Lord God who cleanses us with the water of the word. Yes, I said to myself, absolutely amazed by the revelation given by the act of obedience that cleansing is continual. I turned around and ascended the stairs. The angels remained holding the white fabric above their heads, and they gathered around me closely. Together we walked toward the large altar of burnt offering. I was still hidden within the linen enclosure, dripping wet. And the angels circled the bronze altar, holding the linen enclosure above their heads. I looked at the coals burning beneath the grate, and they were hot. Nothing was being offered upon this altar because our Lord was the sacrifice of the whole burnt offering on the cross. I looked at the burning coals. No one said what I should do. It must be a puzzle whose answers already I know. I said within myself, I began to think, if Jesus had paid the full price already, then the altar of the burnt offering is not something you go around. You must go through it. As strange as it was to me, I began to walk forward and I passed right through the bronze altar, coals, heat and all. Incredible. On the other side of the altar, my father's voice spoke audibly within the temple. Are you willing to live a life of purity sanctified to me alone? Yes, I answered aloud, and the Lord being my helper. The linen breeches, he said. Linen breeches appeared, and I stepped into them. I supposed that they were a sign of the salvation that had been won for me on the earth. The priests had worn these to cover their nakedness. 
And again, my father spoke, are you willing to be teachable, tender, pileable, to stand rightly before me? I will, Christ, being these through me, I said. The tunic, he said. A linen tunic dropped over my head from above. Again, my father spoke aloud. Are you willing to be fa- to be made faithful? Are you willing to be made faithful? Yes, Lord, I answered. The sash, he said. A sash encircled me. And my father continued. Are you willing that the whole head representing the sea be for me alone? The mind of Christ, the sight of Christ, the hearing of Christ, the smelling and the tasting of Christ and the response to touch? Are you willing to be holy unto me alone with the covering of my son upon your head? Yes, Lord, I answered. The cap, he said. The white linen cap enfolded my head. Anointing oil was poured over my head. It ran down the garment to the hem. And suddenly blood appeared on my right earlobe, right thumb and right toe. It had to be the blood of Jesus, for his is the only blood in heaven. And the angels dropped the linen enclosure. It disappeared from their hands. The 24 attendants indicated that I should move forward. They did not go with me. And I, was, I moved forward, the weight of that which was won by Christ on the altar of the cross came onto my upturned hands. I could see nothing, but I felt this and I lifted my hands to wave his sacrifice before the Father. As I walked toward the entrance to the holy place, I heard the 24 elders and the four living creatures begin to sing. Bring forth the priests unto our God, he who sings as, sits as king. Loose your great power over the earth, that earth like heaven may sing. Holy God, our great delight, swallow sin in darkest night. Begin for mercy's sake the fight, O God, begin the end. Praise to the King who reigns on high, Zion above will sing. We hold before you bowls of prayers, they, their tribute to we bring. Release the seal that they may stand, first fruits here above. Blood washed in the blood of the Lamb, gifts of his intimate love. Our crowns we throw beneath your feet, eternal God of might. All power, love and majesty are yours, great God of light. Those standing still upon the earth, let them live above to join us in continual praise, consumed at last by love. And let them walk mid coals of fire. Hear great Yah our prayer. Let the circle be complete, O King beyond compare. Let them hear and let them speak to hallow your great name. Let your glory be visibly seen. Set their hearts aflame. Release the Lamb to open above the seal that seals the end, that righteousness with purest love might dwell on earth again. Holy God, our great delight, swallow sin in darkest night. Begin for mercy's sake the fight, O God, begin the end. Their song ended as I crossed the threshold to the holy place. The weight of the wave offering was lifted from my hands. As I passed into the holy place, I appropriated that was which was symbolized Christ there, the light of the golden lampstand, as well as the bread, wine, and the frankincense on the table of shoe bread. I came to the altar of incense before the holy of holies, because I had passed through the bronze altar. I felt that I must pass through this altar also, and it symbolized Christ's ministry of intercession. As I began to move through the altar, the aromas of the smoking incense clung to me, and I continued to move forward, lifting my hands. I passed the veil, which had been rent at the time of our Lord's death, and entered the Holy of Holies. The sprinkled blood of Christ's sacrifice was already on the mercy seat. The smoke of his fragrant intercession filled that chamber. The unburned spices of the incense that is most holy to the Lord were also present. Since Christ had paid the full price to gain our access to the Father, I passed through the Ark of the Covenant. On the other side of the Ark of the Covenant, the blood of Christ, as well as the holy anointing oil, was sprinkled upon me and upon the priestly garments. My heavenly Father spoke to me again. You are ordained and consecrated unto me this day, Anna, priest forever. There is a time of being shut away, however, before you assume your duties. The angelic attendants appeared after my father's admonition. And as my father had said, the 24 attendants brought to me the covenant robe, the veil, and the crown. The headgear of a priest became eternal. Internal. The breeches, tunic, and the sash remained on me. 
As the angels prepared to dress me, one attendant said, You come to this union with nothing but the Son of God's cleansing, his sacrifice, his blood, his aromas and his anointing. Suddenly we heard the blast of a distant shofar. He comes, the angels said with much excitement. The horn blew again. Quickly they slipped the covenant robe over my head. The garment had the fragrance of myrrh, aloes and cassia. Mingled with these aromas were those of the spices of the holy anointing oil, of the holy incense and of the garden. Each aroma was intensified with the embroidered robe was worn. The fragrance was everywhere. I noticed that the palms of my hands were still stained red from the henna. I suppose that the soles of my feet were still stained also. The angels placed the borrowed crown of life upon my head. And together they raised the circular full-length veil. I thought that they would release it to float down upon me, and instead I realized that my Heavenly Father was veiling me by the power of the Holy Spirit. As it descended, he spoke a blessing over me. Become thousands of ten thousands, my child. Suddenly we heard a shout, and then Jesus called to me from a distance, Anna! I turned to look for him. He comes, the angel said excitingly. Immediately, he burst into view. He was riding the most beautiful white steed I had ever seen. The horse was galloping at top speed. The sight of Jesus knocked the breath out of me. He was wearing a white with a gold crown on his head. He was very, every inch a king and every inch the desire of all nations. Without allowing the horse to break stride, he scooped me up and he pulled me onto the horse to sit in front of him. With his left arm, he held me securely to himself. The angelic attendants clapped and jumped, spinning around with joy. The white stallion began to climb up and up over the terrain of paradise. He galloped on the wings of the wind. It was glorious. And when we reached the sea of glass, the white horse began to descend. He came to a halt at the back of the throne room. All assembled raised a great shout of joy. And then cutting through the shout, one lone angel near the throne began to sing. Blessed is he who comes. Blessed is he who comes. Chapter 11. Ceremony of Formal Betrothal. Jesus dismounted from the white horse. Immediately he turned to me to help me dismount. Holding me around the waist, he lowered me onto the sea of glass. As I passed in front of him, he breathed in the fragrance released from the covenant robe. He said, you have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. For a moment, we stood looking at each other, and then both he and the white stallion disappeared. The 24 angelic attendants appeared near me on the sea of glass. They busied themselves preparing me for the ceremony. They smothered the covenant garment and straightened the veil as they worked, they smiled up into the face at times to reassure me. Suddenly I realised that I was facing the entire assembly of heaven. The collective splendour before me was overwhelming. The sea of glass was packed with angels and the redeemed angels. Angels also filled the atmosphere above. Everyone wore white. There were thousands upon thousands gathered and they shone like icicles on a sunny winter's day. They glistened. Brighter than the more was the glory of my father. His piercing white light at the center of the throne radiated out into a rainbow of vibrant colors. The 24 stately elders flanked him. Angels of his presence stood near the altar of incense before the throne. The four living creatures that are full of eyes were watching. The huge cherubim on either side of the throne peered through the intense light. The seven torches that symbolized the attributes of the Holy Spirit burned even brighter in front of my father. Amid this breathtaking splendor, images of the planets and stars were passing in re review before their creator. Creation itself was tro trooping the colors, paying homage to its king. Again, the one lone angel sang, Blessed is he who comes, blessed is he who comes. My heavenly father laced together the fingers of his hands of light. Slowly he stretched out his arms over the sea of glass, his hands cupped into a dome, a canopy. And then Jesus, more beautiful than all creation, stepped beneath this canopy. He was dressed in white with a gold crown on his head. The images of the stars and planets halted in place. The seven flames of fire swung around to circle the canopied area. 
Now Father, Son and the Holy Spirit were manifested together for the ceremony. The extraordinarily thrilling was the sight that the mighty assembly erupted into praise. Glory to the Lamb, glory to the King, glory to the three in one. Let exultions ring. The 24 attendants began to move forward by twos, and there was awe in their reverence. I remember the words of Psalm 211, Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. The nearer these angels drew to the canopy of my father's hands, the brighter they shone. I could understand why my father called them stars. They were like brilliant lamps or torches. And two of these angels remained with me to help me move forward at the right time. When the other attendants had stationed themselves outside of the seven flames of fire, the angels with me indicated that now I should move toward the canopy. I swallowed hard. I began to walk towards Jesus, feeling very small among this stunning assembly. I marveled that the stars and planets would be witness to the ceremony too. Then the entire gathering began to sing, and as they extolled our God, I lost my nervousness. Instead, my heart raced with expectancy. Brighter than a thousand suns is the Son of Righteousness, through whom all things were begun, in whom all things blessed. Bow before his majesty, the created of the sod. Glory to the one, yet three. Glory to our God. Countless, countless thousands bow before his throne. Countless, countless thousands worship God alone. He created heavens and earth, eternity's vast plan. By his word he brought to birth blessings from his hand. Power hides he in his hand, light within the sun. Unfolding mercies like a span, hail great three in one. As I continued forward, I saw many whom I knew within the crowd. Some were relatives who had died in years past. My earthly father was among them, but my eyes and attention were upon him to whom I was going. I thought of Psalm 45, 10 to 11. Forget your people and your father's house, then the king will desire your beauty. I did feel that I was being transferred from my earthly father's house to the abode of my husband. Also among those gathered were the angels assigned to me. Some I knew, some I did not know. But I could tell that these were angels assigned to help me because they were smiling broadly. As I neared the little house of light created by my father's hands, I wanted to share my consent. I wanted to say, yes, yes, I agree to all three members of the Trinity. I felt as light as a wisp of air. I was cornucopia of joy. (laughs) Jesus smiled at me as I passed one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit stationed around the perimeter of my father's canopy. As I stepped beneath the canopy, I could contain my joy no longer. I began to walk through an acceptance. The movements were like a stately dance. I circled Jesus three times, one encircling for each member of the Trinity. And as I weaved gently between the mighty torches of the Holy Spirit, I overflowed with love for all three. Like Rebecca, I wanted to say, I'll go with this man. I began to sing a new song. Song of the Bride. Hear thou great Redeemer blessed, deep within my heart find rest. You who birthed me from your side, then called me forth to be your bride. I exult in you alone, and take your heart to be my home. Love a friend, redeem a son, eternal husband, make us one. A private moment. And when the third circuit had been completed, I took my place at the right of Jesus. I had publicly given my consent before a multitude of witnesses. He looked deeply into my eyes and spoke privately to me. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a signet ring upon your finger. And gently a talus settled over our heads. And Jesus spoke again, this time in a manner that would bear public witness to all. I betroth you to me forever. I betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice in loving kindness and in compassion, I betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know God. Then lifting my veil slightly, he took my right hand into both of his. He held my right index finger encased with his, within his right hand as he spoke. Behold, you are consecrated to me. A golden light encompassed my right index finger, and from my finger the light spread over my whole being. 
my father's hands of light became a brilliant cocoon. And besides Jesus, the only one I could see was the Holy Spirit manifested in flaming towers. The light became more and more intense. I saw two white eagles cartwheeling. And then slowly, as in a ritual dance of birds, I felt suspended with the dazzling light and fire. It was as though Jesus and I began to a stylized, a styled courtship dance. And I felt that I was a vapor that could be inhaled, a vapor that could be carried into the fire and the light. And this was light that could be breathed. It was light that was alive. It went through me as if it was not there at all. I became one with the light in a dance with it. It was as though within the light and fire, I too became light and fire. We were vaporous, blending, circling, homogenized, yet distinct, fused but separate. The two became entirely one and then separate again. Although this dance began slowly, it accelerated to a lightning speed. The dance was lightning, lightning fire and light, glorious in the extreme. And then, as if some suspended silence, I began to hear my father sing. It was creative sound, a lullaby from the heart of him who sings to his creation, from him who holds all things together by the word of his power. And he had given the universe its sounds so that all might sing back to him. In this rare suspended silence, I could hear the singular sound released from all creation, from deep within himself, our God, like a father rocking his child, sang lovingly to his universe. I sensed the perfect unity within the Godhead, their harmony. By being brought into the Godhead, I began to experience their unity. I shared in their oneness. And Jesus was giving me the desires of my heart. And as he had sworn in greater measure, I began to know God. And from this suspended place, I became conscious again of the ceremony. My father's canopied hands, the seven torches of fire, Jesus, the attendants, the angels and the redeemed all came back into focus. I was once again under the canopy with Jesus. A jubilant shout came from the assembled. Together they proclaimed, consecrated celebration. And the throne room erupted in celebration. Dancers began careening past us, reaching out to wish us well. Jesus touched hand after hand. I was smiling but somewhat dazed. Jesus looked over at me and then speaking with affection to those who were reaching toward us, he said, please excuse us. And smiling, he took my hand and he said, come. Chapter 12, The Spirit and the Bride. Instantly, Jesus and I were walking on a path in paradise. I was a little overwhelmed. I sighed wistfully, and then rallying with unexpected speed, I smiled. People come and go so quickly here. And Jesus laughed. He put his arm around my waist. I wanted to be with you privately before you return, he said, and they will understand. I want to be with you too, I said. His answer made me feel very loved. I leaned my head in on his shoulder. I noticed that the covenant robe and the golden crown I had worn were gone. Again, I was wearing the plain white robe, although I could barely see the veil that remained. It was more of an indication than a noticeable presence. I felt that it was a sign of being separated unto Christ. I supposed that I would be seen after we were fully married. The path we were walking topped a hill. From there, other hills lay before us. Each was covered with the Rose of Sharon. The rolling terrain was a vivid red, and we walked in silence. I could sense that something was on his heart. Anna, he said finally, divisions are coming. He looked out over the hills, and for those who embrace the fear of the Lord and follow his precepts, his golden goodness will pour upon them. But for those who do not embrace the fear of the Lord, he continued, who scorn the precepts in his ways, that which they already have will be taken from them. And God is not mocked, Anna, and the ways of the flesh are not condoned. He continued, but the sunshine of his face will shine upon the righteous. He'll set the captives free. He will nurture them with loving kindness, and they will eat the fat of the land. For he is a father who has mercy upon his children, and he will not hide his eyes from their distress. 
He is from everlasting to everlasting. My love and his goodness stretches as far as his never-ending presence. For those who embrace his precepts, he continued, he will open every door to his storehouses. No good thing will he withhold. And they will swim, they will float on the fat of the land. They will stride from mountaintop to mountaintop, measuring off their inheritance and celebrating his ever-present nearness. He continued, he will take these aloft and they will sit with his son and they will sup with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He will bring together those who fear his name and they will have fellowship in him. And those who are swindlers and liars also will find each other, he said, and their fellowship will be with their father. And those who love themselves more than they fear the Lord will have their old nature as their companion. Fretting and self-righteousness will be their reward. They will face closed doors to God's glory at every turn. Grace will slam its door in their faces. The wall between them and God's goodness will be too high to climb and they'll spend their days searching for God as a blind man gropes in a foreign land. He continued, But for those who hold to his ways and fear his name, a canopy of goodness will be their shelter. A canopy of glory will be their home. Not even a toe will poke its way from beneath the mercy and loving kindness of the Lord. He tilted his head back as if to proclaim over the hills. Rejoice, O righteous one, your God is coming down to you. You will walk with him as at the dawn of creation, and he will share with you as a man shares with his dearest friend. He will reveal mysteries to you and fling open the portals of heaven, allowing you to walk among the stars. From forever to forever, he is. From forever to forever, his goodness will be savoured by those who love the Lord. Rejoice, you people of God. He is coming down to you, the light of his glory shining from his face, and you too will share his goodness with others to the glory of his name. He continued, Prepare, for he comes, and all eyes will see him in you. His people and you will be hidden and folded in the wings of his love, never to come out again. Let the righteous rejoice. He turned to me. As for you, Anna, you have begun to live above. You will no longer call earth your home. And when each day ends, you will return to your father's house and there you will rest. We'll be together, my love. We will go into the fields that are white for harvest and into the vineyards to inspect the vines. His hand reached out to mine. My beautiful bride, my chosen one, he said. I took his hand and kissed it and held it to my cheek. He continued, there's so much to see, know and understand. You have only begun, Anna. We'll go higher, my love, ever higher. Right now, he said, your work on earth awaits. And he bent down and he gathered an armful of the Rose of Sharon. For you, my bride, placing them into my left arm. Thank you, I whispered, pressing the flowers to me. And the Holy Spirit appeared on the path. He was turning gently as an upward spiral of smoke might rise. And the Holy Spirit has come to escort you, my love, he said. Are you ready to return? I am ready, I said to Jesus. I was still holding his hand reluctantly. I released it. However, he held onto my hand and looking deeply into my eyes, he said, You have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart. Both of our eyes filled with tears. He released my hand and I took a step backward to show that I was ready to leave. The circling wind of the Holy Spirit enveloped me. Instinctively, I closed my eyes and through the whirling sound, I heard Jesus call, You are my beloved. I responded, You are my friend. I was choking back tears and the Holy Spirit picked me up and suddenly he went swish down through the turf of paradise. I did not want to look. And when I opened my eyes, I was standing in the living room of my apartment in Florida The flowers were gone, but the hope chests were piled up too and then through the ceiling as before. The Holy Spirit swirled around me. His whirlwind left circles of supernatural fire on the floor. I held out my hands to feel the tiny, brilliant lights that whirled within the funnel. They tickled like sparks from sparklers. Oh, my friend, I said to the Holy Spirit, we will work together, will we not? And the light within the funnel brightened immensely in response. I already miss him, I confided. I reflected a moment. It says that the spirit and the bride say, come. He joined me in saying, come to Christ. 
and this seemed to please him greatly. The sparklers plumbed into a fiery whirlwind of God. He began to ascend through the ceiling, and as he rose, he burned through the roof, opening the entire apartment up, up to heaven. <laughs> I watched him rise, and he was spectacular. I thought of the children of Israel in the pillar of fire by night. And then I realized that the Holy Spirit had left behind his flames of fire on my head and on both of my shoulders. They formed a canopy. Jesus had spoken of a covering of goodness and of glory. Was this canopy of fire and anointing that would rest upon those who fear the Lord? Had the time come for his bride to call him down? As the heavenly council had prayed, was it time for the Lord to begin the end? I exploded with hope and joyous anticipation. Looking into the open heavens, I affirmed. The weight of glory of our God rests upon his head, and keys of the greater David are on his shoulders spread. Fire is burning up above and fire on either side. Beneath this canopy of love, his presence does abide. Come down, O glorious majesty, come down, our righteous king. Descend in holy fire once more with host past numbering. I raised my arm toward the open heavens and with great yearning caught again. Come down, our glorious majesty. Come down, our righteous king. And descend in holy fire once more with host past numbering. Come, Lord Jesus. The End